to imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. With your host, Kamen Neutron. Broadcasting from a secret underground lair in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A gigantic middle finger to everything that is rock about music, rock and roll, and paper power. The thing is, though... If you don't laugh, you're going to go on a killing spree with sharp and nails. Confidence of a hero or a fool, I wasn't exactly certain which. Could not be more professional. It's the real world, I choose to devote my life to. That's okay. It means something, it means something. My take with what's yours. Protonic Reversal! That's like a science thing, right? <laughs> yes, yes. It is a science thing, it is a science place, scientific fact. We are all up in your face, it is time. Once again, once again, once again, once again, once again for the one, the only. Protonic Reversal. Welcome to it. All right. Round two, stay at home edition. Round two, stay at home edition of Protonic Reversal. Actually, wait. Today's Thursday? (laughs) This is the regular slot. (laughs) Well, let me explain something here. What we're doing is a bunch of episodes for posterity, right? the, The thing is we're trying to keep you home, and we're trying to keep you entertained, and so that's what's happening, and we're running a lot of these. Now, what's happening is that I'm doing a lot of these episodes, and it's all kind of running together for me, but there's been a lot of great feedback, so really appreciate everyone listening to the episodes, sharing them around, letting other people know that it's something worth checking, worth checking out. And all the archives, RadioNeutron.com. Uh, Patreon.com slash Protonic Reversal uh, to support the show. A dollar a month will get you there. Have I mentioned what's going on? Uh, well, uh, Tom Hazemeyer, right now. Uh, well, not right now. Pretty pretty soon. Pretty soon. Is there anything else? Um, I don't know. Let's get right down to it. Talk Tom Hazemeyer. Let's listen to a Halo of Flies tune. <laughs>
cool, cool. That's Tired and Cold by Halo of Flies. Some young up-and-comers there. And on the phone right now, we have none other than Mr. Tom Hazelmeyer. Tom, welcome. Hello. <laughs> How goes? You staying, staying safe I'm up on there? The phone. <laughs> Shut up. I'm on the phone. What? Who is this? <laughs> this is the pizza you ordered. Oh, damn. You guys are late. I get it free. <laughs> Oh man, how's it how's it going up there with your quarantines? Is a uh, is, is, is quarantine awesome. panic kicked in? <laughs> what do you mean? Which panic? There's <laughs> multiple panics. Panics over that it's Ebola AIDS and we're all gonna die, or panics over you can't get a haircut, or panics over picking a party. On which side is on the virus? <laughs> yeah, exactly. This, the important thing is to be panicked, though. Definitely for sure. Exactly. That's, Lose that's, your shit. That's the key. That's the key element. Uh, it's it's. It's not surprising to anyone that it seems like you've maintained a, a good degree of keeping busy and doing cool stuff. Uh, just well, I mean, I was kind of, of a, I was headed towards shutdown anyhow. I'm, I'm missing maybe two trips to the restaurant a week. That's about it for me. Otherwise, I was holed up a couple years back. So yeah. just me and the wife were joking. It's like, yeah, this isn't really a big, uh, a big stretch for us. I mean, <laughs> we're in our fifties. The kids are out of the house, and it's just like. I wasn't, I wasn't exactly tearing it up every night at the rock show. Yeah, yeah, you're not you're not exactly go, going out dancing necessarily or, or or whatnot, right? Exactly. Well, uh, you've got a, a good amount of stuff going on. There, I was trying to think about what everything has happened since last we talked. It's been so because there's talking on the show, and of course, there's talking in person. There's been quite a bit, uh, not the least of which is the uh, the downtown the downtown Grumpies is uh, no buenos, no more. It's uh, been chased out by the gigantic space egg that. Uh, yes, it was chased out. It. Chased out by the yuppies. Yeah, man, that's a. Was that a difficult decision, or was that an easy decision? Uh, half and half. I mean, it, it was difficult in so far as that I would have stayed there another twenty years had we been allowed to. Mm-hmm. But uh, the way downtown politics are, it's like the city council wants nothing more than those high rises. Because, I mean, I'll say it publicly: it's like when we moved there, we were paying six thousand dollars a year in property taxes, and when it got to about sixty-five thousand dollars, is when I started saying uncle. Yeah. And it's like you can't run a rummy bar, you know, like a fucking rock and roll shithole, paying top dollar, you know, to exist. Right. Right. Yeah, and not that, the, that, that was the that was the bummer part. Is that that part was amazing. It's a great twenty years. Um, the down the the part that had me ready to fucking leave. Most of the crew as well is like just the transition from downtown from being kind of a no man's land of of my youth to uh, this yuppie beehive of like a battle between boomers and millennials as to who could fuck it up more. <laughs> well, and that's something that especially when you when there's community right when it's like a community situation and like you're you're building something and then it almost seems like something's coming in like a hostile force trying to like terraform the planet you know their way with like <laughs> with, with like branch yeah. places well, they, and whatnot and they win they win by sheer numbers you know yeah like locals. and it's just like it's i'm not i'm not <laughs> crying in my beer i did okay you know it's like we had a 20-year run i'm never gonna bitch about that we did some really cool shit there but uh yeah when you're you know walk into the coffee shop next the new coffee shop next door that's like you know, 11 in the morning, it's like, oops, 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 oops. And, and a coffee and a donut costs you $12. Yeah. Would you, like, would, you oh, like, would you like to people. take out a loan for that transaction, or will you be paying with credit card? <laughs> yeah. And, and the uh, uh, 11 and a half minutes watching someone, you know, be a mixologist with your coffee, you're just like, oh, dude, just give me the fucking bro. Jesus. <laughs> so put some more oil in your beard or something Fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> so minneapolis has changed quite a bit uh, especially that the downtown area but it does seem like there's still a very vibrant kind of cool weird music scene uh scene such as it is with, with lots of great bands i mean do you feel like that's slow down or change at all because it kind of seems like minneapolis is sort of killing it as far as awesome bands no it's, it's always it's uh uh it's always gained momentum from you know the the late 70s early 80s uh it's just literally keep you know there's more music bars than ever which is the opposite of a lot of places um right. i don't know how long that'll last for but right now it's great you know there's just like 
I remember, you know, coming up in the, in the, you know, quote unquote glory years, there was two places for, you know, non cover bands to play. I mean, it's the weirdest thing for me is watching it. Cause we were a fourth tier. I've never heard of it. Many what town to uh, like population explosion and, and explosion and so many other things that it's actually a, a, a major metropolitan area considered seriously by some folks. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's the weirdest shift from traveling the country 20 plus years ago where people would be like, Minneapolis, isn't that in Indiana? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> is that in Ohio? Where is that again? <laughs> Where is that? Somewhere we fly over once in a while. Yeah. Well, or my favorite all the time, too, is, are you Canadian? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. Definitely. <laughs> no, the first few times I got that in New York or L.A., it's like, are you Canadian? It's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Fuck you. <laughs> fuck you, and eh? like, wait a second. I actually got more in common with Canadians than I do you fuckheads. Yeah, I'm Canadian. Fuck it. Yeah, although since you didn't preemptively apologize afterwards with a sorry or something, then they know you're not authentic. <laughs> sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> the one I always used to get, I used to get busted with, no. Or where you go, are you Canadian? No. Are you sure you're not Canadian? You, uh, it seems like you might be Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say house. I said house. Well, so and and you've seen the city grow and change quite a bit, and and you've you've been through multiple epochs of time where that's happened. So, I mean, what, what would you say from the perspective of someone that's you know kind of seen stuff rise and fall the entire time? It would, would where would you say the overall Minneapolis? "Quote unquote state of the scene would be uh, as oh, far man, as I'm just the like, last one. I'm the last one to call that. Like I wasn't joking when I said I don't get out. I mean the past the past uh, 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 God almost ten years I've devoted to more of like the visual doing the actual physical art yeah. stuff and uh, just kind of pulling out of you know the music world. So it's like stuff I you know stuff comes to my attention and I really like a lot of shit that's going on here right now." A lot of new younger bands that are fucking tearing it up, but uh, I'd be the last one to be able to assess the health and vibrancy of our scene. Right. Well, and it seems like it's still, from an outside perspective, anyway. It seems like it's at least a relatively okay place to make art. Still, like it seems like there's still the ability to do that relatively, relatively sustainably compared to say other places. Yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I've, I've been very uh, uh, doubtful up until this point. I mean, I think we're at a pivotal moment like, from here forward. Up until this point, I've been starting to get really doubtful about the future of places like, you know, Minneapolis and Austin and Chicago and other places that have been kind of these, like, you know, stalwarts for creativity. Because they, they, part of the equation is that, you know, you're sitting in Minneapolis, well, you're drawing all the weirdos from, you know, that weird kid in art class from South Dakota and you know, North Dakota and Iowa and Western Wisconsin and, you know, gain, you know, which has happened in every metro metropolitan area. You know, Texas, Austin was the, if you were a weirdo anywhere in Texas, you wound up in Austin. Yeah. And then over the past 10 years, that quit being the case because of economics. You know, it's like a kid from Duluth or, or, or Fargo couldn't afford, you know, the past 10 years, it's getting harder and harder for that kid to come here because it's like this, you know, huge explosion of real estate and the cost of living in the, this kind of city. Watch that same thing happen across the country in a lot of cities that, you know, used to be the go-to place. I was kind of definitely being coming skeptical of the future here for that reason, you know. Right. Well, well, no city is, is a, it's unto itself utterly, you know what I mean? It's like New York, what would New York be if it wasn't for transplants for, you know, the past hundred years? Totally, and it's something where it's, it's. I think it's notable that you know, like Richard Hells from Kentucky. Yeah, you know, it's like go through the whole. You know, no way, people. It's like you know, Lydia Lynch was from State of New York. You know, down the list. It's just like wasn't a ton of like actual quote unquote New Yorkers. Sure, and it's uh, that it's. I feel like. I mean, do you think that that might have something to do with like the internet kind of tying people together and stuff that everyone's like, oh, wow, Austin's a place to go. Okay, let's go over there. And just this idea that there's more of an ability to quote unquote choose your choose your path a little more now. And like it might be a little more rather than yeah, like, that oh, let's do I've something been, cool I've been trying Dallas. to di digest that and, and, and uh, you know, try to come up with some sort of uh, assessment just from watching it, like how that pl pans out. I yeah. mean, that. On one level, it's it's kind of bummed me out because the internet has allowed these you know extreme 
niches to occur that kind of sap the energy of like scenes of the past. You know, it's like, I've talked about this before, but you know, I think back to uh, like, you know, my experiences like in, 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 uh, you know, the, the hardcore scene, the, the, you know, of the early, early eighties or, or, you know, some of the noise scene after that and stuff, there was always this weird, insane cross pollinization happening of, uh, different sources, different groups kind of coming together and colliding, you know, like we were just a moment ago talking about the, the, you know, 70s, the the original punk scene in New York, which I obviously have no, no knowledge about. I wasn't there, but just reading about it, it was like all these weird, you know, groups colliding, cross pollinating each other. And now it's like, if I, you know, I like nothing but, you know, pure noise and it has to be only made with, you know, fucking tire rims. And it all, everyone has to be, you know, transitioning. There's a niche for that. <laughs> so right, right. I'll find those other 78 people in America that think the same way on that one specific thing. And then we'll cloister off on the internet versus having to go into a bar to find, you know. Yeah. Other weirdos who might not be the exact same, but then I joined that band with, you know, the guy who's running the gay bathhouse and that weird blue collar kid who likes beating people up and then, you know. And then there's this fucking band of these bizarro sources, police is coming together, creating this like weird energy. Like that, that kind of seems to be not happening as much. Yeah. It's almost like people are more, it's, it's, it's very convenient to be able to like sort of self sort that way and just cloister. And it, kind of take, it, takes, it takes the uh, energy out of shit. Yeah. Like uh, the word I keep using is like cross pollination. Cause it's like that weird mixing it up. Like God, I would have never heard of this guy Burroughs if it wasn't for you, art school boy, telling me that. You know right, I mean? right, like, totally, totally, and, and and like finding, you know, finding out about cool stuff almost as part of the uh, part of the experience, rather than like being like, oh, well, this person checks all the boxes for all the right things that I like as well, so I will now hang yeah. out with this person. And well, and that's that's okay. So you bring up a good point because uh, that has seemed to stop the creation of new and different. It seems like everyone's settling for, oh, well, this is my niche here. I just like ska from neo ska <laughs> from 1979 to 1981. That's it. That's the, all I like. These years, yeah. Well, and and then it almost comes to the time of with creatively, like there's bands that are almost Civil War reenactors, right? So, yeah. Well, that that's been going on for a while. That's <laughs> yeah. That, that, that's garage a band. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gar- that the, garage that rock Redux mash- number five or whatever we're on. That's the mash syndrome where your band. You know, mimicking 1967 lasted 20 times longer than 1967. Whereas <laughs> right. MASH, the TV show, outran the actual war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, how long have they been I fighting think, this I goddamn war? Like eight, I think the, whole, the show was on eight years and the yeah. war was two. Yeah. But it, that, that, that kind of syndrome definitely is, has existed before, but not to this level of like literally every genre from the past 30 years as being, you know, propped up weekend at Bernie's style by some kid who should be inventing his own youth movement. Yeah, do, doing, doing your own crazy stuff. And it's, I mean, it's in culturally, I understand there's precedent for that. I mean, Christ, the baby boomers, boomers have been talking about like 1969. You, you, you think it was like three decades long. And it's like, Oh Christ. Another thing about Woodstock, huh? Great. But it's, it's so disappointing for me to see people kind of fall in line with that same sort of thing where, where it's like, okay, well, you're fetishizing something that you weren't there for rather than like being okay with like making something new. Cause all those people that were there when that was happening, they weren't, there wasn't a natural audience for all of that. Like, you know, maybe there, oh, there was someone no, like there's 20 people in a room. Yeah. Exactly. You know, the, the, the thing is, it's like, I get it. It's like, there's, you know, there's certain moments of history that I worship and idolize, even though I was nowhere fucking near it. Not, you know what I mean? But at the same time, it's like, I never, like you said, Civil War and reenact it. Mm-hmm. It's like I've always had a soft spot for like, you know, English mod become, you know, freak beat psychedelia, the creation in that moment in time. And I still listen to a lot of this stuff. You know, it inf- infected me or, 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 or uh, influenced me, but I didn't want to like, you know, sit there and, and make play it. it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know. <laughs> exactly. It's like, no, I'll, I'll take part of this and roll it into my own thing that I'm trying to do, you know? Right. And, and those moments too, it's like, yeah, that, that first, you know, let's say 1981, you know, 80, late 80 to 82 for hardcore, fucking amazing. You know, I just, 
that to me was like a pinnacle. It was a high watermark in my life. I love that. The energy, the shit that was going on, the excitement of it, being able to see it, a part of it. But for fuck's sakes, you can't do it 30 years later. It doesn't fucking matter. You're missing out on your own energy to not roll up your sleeves and try to you know, tell the whole world to fuck off by throwing something new in their face that they don't want, you know? Yeah, it should be something where it's it's a little bit uncomfortable. And I think that like when I think about when I think of bands that I really am into, it's usually there's some even if they slot into a genre, there's something there that's sort of like, oh wow, that's pretty wrong. That sounds kind of, kind of jacked up. Like, what's going I've on? Wait, yeah, it's like I've been so disappointed. It's like, god damn it, where's the youth to do something to upset me? Oh god, god that's not fucking music. Ah, yeah. oh, Jesus Christ. Instead of like, <laughs> oh Jesus Christ, that again. Yeah, oh, you're doing that thing, huh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh great we get to you know relive that whole movement yeah awesome it, was, it, was, it sucked the first time well so then that brings up to an interesting point well how do you feel about folks sort of i hesitate to use the word fetishizing but maybe putting on a pedestal the the classic amrep uh era right where it was an active label and like you're putting out bands like cows and things along those lines that People seem to look at it with rose-colored glasses and 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 behaving as if it were like, oh, well, this was like a huge thing and a cultural paradigm that shifted everything. And it's like, well, if you were part of that, yeah, but it wasn't like, you know, the God bullies were yeah, not a household that, name. You know what I mean? Definitely, a, it's definitely. <laughs> I, I I vacillate rapidly back and forth where it's like, on one hand, you appreciate that people recognize it, but on the other, you're like, you know. Uh, I think I might have told you this story, but it was one of my favorite Grant Hart stories. Is we were standing outside a art opening, shooting the shit, and two, you know, guys walked by with like GBH jackets. This is only ten years ago, and mohawks, and just out of the blue, Grant just turns over his shoulder and says, "Hey, fuckheads, why don't you get your own youth movement?" <laughs> so good. And I it's just, I just, you know, <laughs> fell over on my side because I was half in the bag, just laughing my ass off because it was just like unexpected. And there's like a lot of truth to it. It's like, Jesus Christ, you know, quit fucking fucking my corpse. Go fuck something new, you know? Yeah. I mean, so like I said, on one hand, I appreciate it. And there's definitely some cool shit going on with, with bands kind of copping that certain aspects of that. But uh, on the other hand, you're just like, man, I just want to hear. I just want to have my fucking head blown off with something I've never heard before. Right, right. And so, yeah. And for me... I, I always appreciate when a band you know has a clearly defined aesthetic and they're coming from someplace, but I like it if they do go somewhere weird with it. And I also just really love when there's a band that I just can't freaking figure out at all. And it's yeah, it's, that that's the one. I, that's the one kick that I've not had in a while. And that's yeah, that like, trying to explain that to somebody is damn near impossible. You're like, you don't understand. The first time I heard Gang of Four in 1979. I had never heard anything like yeah, that. Like you're it was coming like from that, a different that, planet. <laughs> exactly. And you're just standing there like kind of like uncomfortable and stimulated going, what the fuck is happening? What, what is this? I can't wrap my head around it. I don't have any immediate comparisons. Whereas, you know, for the past, you know, 10, 15 years, it's like, yeah, those guys have been listening to cramps a little too much or right. oh, that band there, you know, well, obviously they got a few college records in their collection. Oh, ever heard the Melvins much? Yeah, it's, it's kind yeah. of like. Uh, I mean, I remember I, even. I, I want, I want more of that. You know, that that whole birthday sure. party, same thing. Um, you know, and that's just my my life. My you know things I that one of the first time I heard them, I was just like, what the fuck, you know? Dude, I mean, there there are there are some bands that I mean, I love the birthday party. They're one of my favorite bands of all time. But there are a few bands out there they really ought to be paying like Nick Cave and Mick Harvey uh, freaking royalties. It's like, really? Why don't you do your own thing, man? Come on. <laughs> Yeah, but at the same time, too, it's just like, I don't know. I mean, no one comes out of a vacuum, but there was still those moments where, yeah, that, that shit. First time hearing the pistols, same kind of thing, you know. Granted, I, I didn't hear it, you know, as a kid. It was like 78, but I'll never forget it. It's like those well, sure. boots, the, the sound of those boots marching when I dropped the needle. It's like, what the fuck? And like Leiden singing had nothing to go off of, you know. In 78, that could compare to that, that, you know, like, what the fuck, you know? Yeah. It's not in tune. It's not. It's violent. It's really fucked up. He's saying really ugly shit. God, I love this. Yeah, and if there was a band that kind of embodied the same ethos and, and hit that same way without just, you know, hitting the sonic hallmarks that made the Sex Pistols what they were, then that would be interesting. But it's like, I, I hate that, like, now it's like, oh, they, like, never mind the Bullocks, I guess. Okay. 
You know, it's just, I, I, I don't want, and the thing is, for me, and I, I know you feel the same way, like, you don't want to be jaded about something, right? You want to be blown away. You want to be. I, I want, yeah. I, I, I miss that kick. Yeah. And I don't know. It's like, I always, you know, also once in a while, you know, it's like, is it just, you got to become the curmudgeon old guy. Yeah. Ah, I've seen it all. Yeah, there is. Like, I don't want to be that jaded. Well, I remember I, I, I think I shot you over a uh, big pig who just, you know, we played with them in New York, and I was like, wow, these these guys are just genuine fucked up weirdos. And then you you brought the point, it's like, yeah, they probably like Brainiac a lot. I'm like, oh, yeah, they, they, they do kind of have that vibe to it. But it wasn't exactly the same thing. Like, they're on their own vibe. Yeah. Uh, but it's so rare. It's so rare to have, have a band that has its own voice. And when I think back to bands like The Cows, right, where it's, it's like, who, the, who was doing anything remotely close to what The Cows were doing? Like, freaking no one. Like, get out of here. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's weird. I don't know. It's 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 also too. It's like I don't want to be that negative. Sure, but I mean, part of it is too. It's like the the transition and and being stuck in the past in so far as thinking of music in terms that it's not thought of in that light anymore. I mean, you think about like you know, in eighteen, you know, the late eighteen hundreds, poets were rock stars because everyone read poetry. Because the way, you know, what medias were available to you, that was one. It was a viable, creative force of the moment. You know, those guys could tour and pack, you know, halls, people there to listen to them read their poetry. Well, <laughs> fast forward to, yeah. you know, 75 years later when printing is, is there's now there's radio, now there's television, you know, that medium is kept getting shunted off, shoved off to the side. You know, continually to the point of there's four guys in the back of that bookstore on Wednesday night reading shit. Yeah. And I kind of I've been bummed to say this because of how much it means to me personally. But I see the same thing happening with music where, you know, that, that analogy that everyone brings up, like, you know, well, back in our day, we would sit down and listen to a record. Yeah. Back in well, my day. Yeah. <laughs> because we had no fucking choice. Yeah. You know, if we had a video game and the internet to sit there and, you know, fucking. Jesus, can you imagine being a kid with porn that you can get today? Fuck. Instead, <laughs> instead of trying to look at the scrambled stuff and be like, oh, I, 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 I wouldn't something. have been listening to the Sex Pistols so much, you know? Like, right, exactly. What? <laughs> Triple three way anal? <laughs> Fucking sign me yeah. up. Yeah. Sign me <laughs> up. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Where it's like, it, it's kind of, yes, it was this, it, it, was, it was our lives. It, it meant everything because of the moment and the, what place it, the, the amount of it, your attention it could take up. It didn't have that much competition. Yeah. And you also weren't inundated with it. Like now where it's, it's just like, just an know, overload. All oh, the time. there's my favorite band on a fucking shampoo commercial. And, <laughs> Oh, I just heard, I just heard that classic, that underground classic. I love from the New York dolls in the fucking mall. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? Like the music is constantly in movies and it's just like, it's so ubiquitous that, I can see people just not, you know, it doesn't have that place that it used to. And that's the past. I mean, what can you do? Well, and, and also there's a thing that for for folks now, especially kids, it's not just whatever came out that week. It's all of music through all of time. So anything Yeah, that's that going to be a heavy shit to sift through, yeah. you know. That makes sense. I mean, it was just like funny because it's like I think about the stuff I lived through, you know, it's like – the first wave of like punk rock I was exposed to the seventies, you know, the English stuff. I, I didn't discover the New York stuff myself till later. Mm -hmm. You know, then, then there was like the, you know, no wave and, and, uh, like but all the post punk shit that was amazing to me. And then all of a sudden here's this like Neo mod thing pumps up, you know, through with the, uh, like the whole, you know, English ska shit. And I love that stuff. I was like, Oh God, how old are I then? 14. And then all of a sudden, you know, plowing through that stuff and joy division and gang four all of a sudden here comes hardcore and i'm just like holy fuck and off and running and, but then to look back here like you said this is all brand new now it's like you know as a kid you're looking at like 40 years of of whatever style of music you want it's all available right then and there yeah like immediate gratification like oh there's this band called the who let me just you know look listen to all their discography and like process that do 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 okay well, next so it's the it's the scramble of it not being <laughs> linear too like yeah, it all it was exactly. so linear than like this big at this this big at that and you would sit there and you know you'd kind of look at your history of rock and roll and go you know later on i discovered like all the 
the under, you know, sixties garage stuff or psychedelic shit. You know, I remember getting turned on to uh, the blue cheer album. Just like going, Holy fuck. But you know, it was still linear. Like this is ancient news. You know, this blue cheer album was fucking, you know, 15 years ago, which when you're a kid might as well be, you know, centuries. But, <laughs> yeah, exactly. but now like <laughs> all at once, you know, you're like, I, I watched my son kind of discovering music and he was doing it through YouTube. You know, it's like, uh, my sister turned him on to the butthole surfers. So he's on YouTube, watch the butthole surfers. And there's that sidebar. What's this Jesus lizard? What's this cows? What's the, in doing the, the, the rabbit holes. Going down the and, rabbit hole, yeah. <laughs> and it's not linear. It's like, yeah, this, this you know, big black track kind of sounds like this, but that was, there was 15 years in between. He doesn't know that. Yeah, there, there's, there's, the context is, is completely different. And, well, and it, it's, it's led to interesting situations. Like I found personally, I know people that listen to the show regularly are probably really freaking sick of hearing me tell the story. But, I mean, there are bands out there that, th- like, in their minds, a band like Carp was as big as like smashing pumpkins when I was just like, I assure you that's not the case. Like that was, that was not the case at <laughs> yeah. all. And it's, there's been part, part of those ones that drive me nuts is yeah. The, the rewriting of history where people will talk about, you know, this hardcore band and people are paying $2,000 for the single. It's like, those motherfuckers couldn't get arrested in 81. Are you kidding me? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> they couldn't fill the fucking club that, you know, felt like it was at capacity with 20 people. And it's just like that weird history. Yeah, exactly. Where, you know, those guys were doing it. It's like, yeah, okay. But then again, I'm sure I've done plenty of that in my own right. You know what I mean? Like, well, sure. Yeah. It's, it's, it's in not, my it's mind, not the creation were right up there with the Yardbirds and the Who. And it's like, no, they weren't. Yeah, they, they really weren't. Well, but it's interesting <laughs> that, that it, so that's like the, the other side of something where a band that maybe didn't connect fully with, didn't fully find its audience at the time finds the audience like after they're gone, like maybe with a, a different generation. And yes. that's awesome. I'm totally for that. I'm stoked when it happens. Like when it happened, like with the band death from Detroit, and I was so, that was like, I love that story for a lot of reasons. Not the least of which is because like, Oh, I've seen that sort of play out on a, on a smaller scale multiple times over. And like, that's awesome. But, then, well, that's, but that, I got, I got to stop you. That's one of those pet peeves I have with the history of revisionism is name that band. Death is one of them where it's like, these guys invented punk. Yeah. No, no, they didn't. <laughs> no one, they, no one ever heard them. Period. Literally, no one. They didn't release the. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Like, and so everybody ascribes this, like this, 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 this greater meaning as defined by the narrative structure needed to tell the, the story. Where it's like, you know, you don't need to do that. You don't need to like yeah. to be like, well, here's the band that you blah blah. You know, you, you don't need to clickbait headline it. I guess is, is is where I'm going with it. And and but it is so that part's obviously annoying if not completely detestable. But I like the idea that the democratization of the internet has sort of opened the doors that like, you know, a band like this heat or something can find its audience. Like where it's like, wow, those records. Yeah. You know, like as obscure as they get. And this. Yeah. I mean, 13 floor elevators would be a good example. Absolutely. I mean, it's cool. It's cool. On one hand, Cause they literally lit half the fire in San Francisco. Yeah. But they never got, got to, lost uh, to time, but they never did fuck all themselves. But then yeah. it's like they're literally heralded, you know, right alongside of all the big, you know, big boys of that, you know, that generation, that era, which is good. Cool. I, I, I see what you're saying. I, I totally get that, too. Yeah. And like and, you know, Rocky's story just on his own is pretty well indicative of its times. <laughs> just to say, to say the least, but you're right because there are these other stories that, and a lot of times, like whatever documentaries are documentaries, but people get into the idea of telling a story with it, like there being a narrative, and that's always going to happen. But uh, it, it is interesting to see stuff kind of come up from a hive mind level about what or what what was or was not important, and what bands are just lost to history, like bands that, like nobody cares about anymore. Where it's like you have no idea how like big of a deal this band was, where this band this yeah. band like really tied the whole thing together. Yeah, that one is. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, we me and you have talked about Wired before, but I think yeah. they, they've kind of started to fall into that. You know what I mean? Where it's not. They were one of the big, you know the big five. Like when you were discovering like English punk stuff at the time. Yep. You know, it's like they were on you know them, the Damned, Pistols, Clash. They were like right up there. And it seems like history's just kind of like shunted them off a bit. When it's also they to me they, they you know they were writing the whole post punk playbook. Oh, absolutely. Like with every record, even like every yeah, <laughs> you know, every record they would be like, ah, no, we're doing this now, and they're like, what? This is awesome, and it's all great, you know, until it isn't. But 
even then, it was sort of like, well, hey, you know, hats off. That that one isn't for me, but you you done did it, and you you don't sound like you know a third tier Ramones ripoff band while doing it of yourself, and uh, that's nice. I mean, even you know, like whatever. I'm I'm gonna get mad at those latter day Gang of Four records. I'm sorry, Gang of One records because. Oh, see, I, I got that, that. To me, that's that's in my mind. There's the uh, plane crash theory, which is. I can tell you, you you name a band, and if I like them, I can tell you when their plane crashed and they were lost to history. <laughs> like Paul Weller's fiery crash right after the release of the Entertainment album. I see where you're going with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Or The Clash, for me, their plane crashed and they were lost to history. And it was a, just a devastation blow after giving them enough rope. So you after know. Solid Gold, there was no such band called Gang of Four anymore? Gang of Four, that was a horrible crash outside of Jamaica when they were going to vacation. Yeah. And they were never heard from again. And it was such a, I just can only imagine what heights they would have achieved had that plane not crashed. Who knows? Nobody could have predicted. Who knows? <laughs> but man, just those two albums, what yeah, a fucking oh, legacy. What a, what a body of work. What a body of work. Well... And I've, 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 how, how do you feel since, since we're talking about like you know narrative structure being applied to things at, at a at a later level? And I, I realize you probably want to be careful in it. The color of noise, the color of noise doc. Which last time I actually had you on the show, I actually hadn't seen because I, I think I had you on a couple of these before seeing the movie, which is a, a brilliant move and shows why this show is top of the charts. But I think it did a pretty good job of showing the story of Amphibian Reptile. And I say that as someone that, you know, was viewing it from a distance largely. Uh, so how, how, like what, what was like being, being in the story that way? And how did you feel that documentary turned out? Um, I was, I was pretty jazzed with it. I mean, the one thing that people, it's really weird after having it happen where like a, a older guy that I, I was friends with, like, I was like, Hey, he doesn't have any idea, like the music background or stuff, me having done stuff. And so one of the few people I'm like, here, dude, check it out. I, did, here, I have this thing. It's like the DVD. Here, check it out. And he's like, how much does this cost you to make? I'm like, I don't make it. <laughs> like, that's like the that you commissioned a documentary to be made? Your sponsors? Yes. And dude, that is like a commonplace thing. Like I'll have people call, you know, well, um, how come you didn't? Uh, I had a guy that worked with the label pissed off because something wasn't getting covered. I'm like, I'm not making the fucking movie, dude. Call the director. Here's the number. You fucking call. It's not my project. I don't, you know, it's not me. Yeah. That, kind of, that, was, that was always a weird thing. I think they did a really good job. I mean, he kind of, uh, the director, Eric, I mean, he definitely bit off more than he could chew because he wanted to cover a lot of everything. time. A lot, lot, lot of time like to the, cover. He wanted to cover the art aspect and just the weird shit like doing the, the lighters and, and uh, you know, just all these different aspects of stuff. And I was just like, yeah, you know, good luck. I mean, before that, I was thinking about doing a book <laughs> right? and just figuring out how to lay the book out. Like, do I lay it out by band? Do you lay it out by this or the history or yeah. day by day? And I was like, and I quit. Fuck it. I don't want to do it. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got an easy solution for you. I'm not going to freaking do it. <laughs> so he got props. I mean, he, I, the, the, the first time I saw it, I think it was at about three and a half hours long. Wow. And he's like, you know, what do you think I should do? I'm like, dude, I, <laughs> beats me. Good luck. I'm, I'm not a director. Good luck with that, kid. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I appreciate the fact that he, he you know, there, there's live footage of the bands. Like, as you mentioned, it does go in a, a bunch of different directions. And I think it's interesting that there's sort of this ideal, this, this aesthetic that, oh, it's like the, the quintessential Midwest thing. And for sure, for sure, that's a huge part of it. But I like the fact that it told a story about – Hey, you know, like you were in the service, you're in Seattle for for a bit. Like it, it, it told enough of the narrative stuff to kind of give you a, a more articulate picture of what was going on. And yeah, no, he he did a fucking great job. I, I on that level, completely stoked with it. There's not not a major, you know. I think there was literally one input because he he like kind of opened the door. Like, well, what do you think I should do? And I'm like, I'm not fucking telling you what to do. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I don't. Exactly. I'm the last person you should talk to. <laughs> but, uh, I, I mean, there was like one, the only, like, literally, I think the only thing I can think of was, uh, he's like, do you have any suggestions? And it was like, it was like, uh, after seeing it a couple more times, because we were touring, he was touring it early before it was actually finished. I was like, well, you should actually put in all the shit that happened when I was sick. 
Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like, a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Just, just talk to my wife because she knows it all. Just put the whole litany of how many, you know, how bad it was. Like, literally, this lung infection with a, with a 40% survival rate. This, you know, dot, 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 yeah. down the list, the meningitis, the whole, you know. And it's like, that was, that was, that was my whole input as far as direct, you know. Which my, is good direction direct because it's, it's pretty important well, just think, because of the way you had it was dramatic but it didn't convey how serious it was yeah it's, it's almost would be <laughs> like almost a dismissible line for somebody that wasn't paying closer attention like oh that that sucks i mean the main thing i i wanted to is it's like i've seen some documentaries that were uh just fucking egregiously horrible like how the fuck you could take a topic like certain things and make it as bad as some of these documentaries have done <laughs> I just like got, I got, got, got any names you want to mention? <laughs> Man, I don't. I, I I got too old to burn bridges. Where it's like you know after the fucking <laughs> napalming them my whole life. Uh, I, but, don't worry, so I've got a list like, too, as you well know. I don't. I don't want to shit on anyone's fucking parade. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like that. That part of that's one of those things with the wisdom of age. Yeah. I've gotten old enough to realize, like, hey, that's your trip, man. Have fucking knock yourself out. And you know, it's a big world. It, it's 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 not necessary to. But get, to man, be there's been a few rock docks where you're just like, oh my god, how could you turn that into the fucking as boring as that? <laughs> yeah, how did you make this boring? Is is something I definitely have said after watching a few documentaries. Like, how how did you do this? <laughs> it's almost art in its own way. I just wish somebody could uh, sit down and do the Helios Creed one. That would be fucking. That would be. That would be freaking awesome. I would. I mean, that's that's. I was very surprised that the director of the Amrap one didn't follow up with doing a cows documentary because he's like a huge cows fan. I think that was like his his entrance, and he actually even played with the heroin sheiks uh, for a while. And when they were out in New York, oh nice, out of New York, um, played drums with them for a couple of records. I'm not sure. I love the heroin chic records, but I'm not that guy that flips it over and memorizes every band member's name. Right, right, right. Well, I, I appreciated the fact that, I mean, because I, I felt like I learned a lot just by having Kevin on the show. There's all kinds of stuff that, you know, I like the band, but like, whatever. I was like some record store kid in Oakland. I didn't, what do I know from freaking cows? I wasn't even like seeing them. And I appreciated, you know, it was an interesting story and there was like, it doesn't, it's not exactly the typical like rock and roll uh, you know, punk rock documentary story, and I think it was like, yeah, there, there's a lot of stuff to to mine there. It would be, and, and fuck's sake, everyone's still alive. I mean, <laughs> eh, Norm's not. Oh, actually, yeah, shit, my bad. <laughs> but he was, uh, he was like one of the one of what, four drummers. Most of the people are still alive. Let's put two, it two, yeah, four. So, do you think there's ever think they're ever gonna get back and do stuff again? I mean, I could have asked Kevin when he was on, but. <laughs> I I would seriously uh, doubt that. I, I seem to. I kind of. I'm inclined to doubt. I mean, it. none of none of them are are nostalgic guys whatsoever. Yeah. Um, and then I think, uh, yeah, the, the there was a lot of weird stuff with two of the members. One, which was just like I don't to this day understand. Like he didn't want to participate, and they're just like, that oh, was bizarre. Another one has had uh, issues since then that would prohibit him from doing stuff and i don't think the other guys want to deal with it so yeah it's like one of those unfortunate things but i think that's a but then again never say never yeah and it's okay for things to be you know purposefully ephemeral and kind of part of a moment in time too that's that's okay especially you know kevin's man i, I wish i wish a lot more people would realize that yeah and just <laughs> stop <laughs> stop and don't do the reunion just don't do it I, I used to say that I wish I, if, you know, somebody going to these interviews, they asked me like, what, what do you wish your superpower would be? And I said, I wish I could make other bands break up. <laughs> I felt pretty good not, about that one. <laughs> and not be able to reunite. And, and what I would tag to that at this so point your is superpower not falls reunite. short if they can reunite. Yeah. So what I would tag with that now is not be able to reunite because I think that the, 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 the rock and roll reunion complex is pretty out of control at this point, especially where it's like, okay, now are we on like the second or third tier bands now? Like really where people pining for this? this we we touched on that earlier but the, the the thing that drives me nuts is when you know the said band that wasn't that big is now packing you know three thousand seaters like those motherfuckers couldn't fucking fill a room with a hundred people back right, in the right, day totally what happened <laughs> how did this happen i mean it's not, it's not that i'm just like necessarily pissed off it's just completely flabber flabbergasted like 
at the rewriting of history, you know, at that point. And then you watch the press act as though, oh, gee, this band was super influential. Six people listened yeah, to yeah. a motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, but all six of them did important things. <laughs> <laughs> they all went on to have TV shows and whatever. I'm like, you know, I, yeah, it's, well, it's yeah, amazing. I mean, don't get me wrong. I adore the Velvet Underground, but the way that they're lionized, it's sort of like, mm, let's, let's all remember where we're at here. Like, they, they, guys, they were outgrowth of, like, an art movement and... It's not like they were packing stadiums, even when, like, you know, the Doug Ewell era, like, they were actively trying to. And, frankly, I, I like the Loaded record quite a bit. But What's bizarre to me is that whole, uh, the 60s, like I said, like, to me, that's, I, I I'm, I'm love reading about it because I don't know anything about it. It's like, I don't want to read about, a, you know, the times that I lived through because yeah, yeah. then, then <laughs> yeah. I'll do ticking on the writer going, dude, what the fuck? That's not true. Oh, that's yeah. bullshit. You know, but. Well, reading about the 60s, well, the one thing that blows me away when you know, like, especially like Velvet Underground, completely fall apart. Like, these bands were playing halls that had a 750 capacity. Yeah. Like, I, like there was, you know, a uh, 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 documentary about the, it's online now, about First Avenue, which is like the famous Minneapolis club. I'm sure you've been there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, used to, I mean, you used to play 7th Street Entry a lot, and I've... I've been to a couple, been to a couple of shows at first out, and it's been uh, it's been the uh, the club since like 1970. You know, it's like yeah. every 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 Minneapolis band from Prince to Litter, who's every they all you know that that was probably when they cut their teeth for the most part, and you know it's totally hugely influential club. But you're seeing who was playing there in 1970, and it was just like it's only a thousand people. These were like the later on stadium bands, you know what I mean? But and and you think of it like you know 1969. Well, that's the height for. You know, I'm trying. I'm trying to think of a good example of a band. You know, Creedence Clearwater. Yeah, if they came to Minneapolis, they'd be playing like this, like you know, really small armory. Right. And you're like, that's the height of that era and the height of like the boomers. Why the <laughs> fuck weren't they playing like a twenty thousand? You know, it's crazy. Like there, you know, there's a there was a, the famous uh, department store here was Dayton's, and you'll hear like you know, the Rolling Stones played the top floor of Dayton's. Well, that holds four hundred people. You know, <laughs> right, exactly. And it's like it's like the Stones at their like top. Top most of the pop most era, and yeah, it well, and, and yeah. I mean, I think it's 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 almost like a well to a certain degree it works both ways, I suppose. But like the rose colored glasses towards history. Yeah, or you know, when you actually stand in the Fillmore. Yeah, oh, you yeah. Know, and you're like, this is the Fillmore. This is where all these great shows and the whole scene. And you're looking at it you're like this is a fucking you know, man, this is big. Ain't yeah, <laughs> like, like I saw Man Rashton. It's a big hall. There. And it was great. It was, you know, they brought out the frickin' they lit, lit, lit the Tesla coil on fire. And fire was awesome. But it's like it's like okay, well, it's it's kind of weird to think about that. You know, Jefferson Airplane was like playing here when you know <laughs> the, the height of yeah. their power and stuff like that. And and a, and a you know eight hundred holding hall, you yeah. know, decrepit hall at that. Yeah, totally. That's it was cool. it was not. I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, but like your 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 mid grade venue these days is more together than some of these like iconic places ever could be in the entire history of their their historic period. Crazy! I had to get the dog in before she fucking yacked yacked her ass off. Talk to me about you know, and, and apologies if we covered this last time. It's been so goddamn long. I don't remember what we talked about, but talk to me about after. You came back from the Marines. You're stationed in Seattle for a bit. Uh, did we ever talk about you like playing to the U-Men? I don't think we did. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a sh- not that long of a stint. It was kind of hard because I was actually stationed an hour north of Seattle. Oh, so right. I, I, I got I got down there like every weekend. That place between Bellingham and Seattle. I can't. Uh, pfft, I can't. Whidbey think. Island. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, pretty yeah, much halfway yeah. halfway between uh, uh, Bellingham and Seattle, or roughly. Um. But the problem was, it's like, I, I fucking love those guys. I mean, ask people as well as they, that was one of my all time favorite bands, but, uh, I couldn't tour. I couldn't do the shit they needed. Also, it's like it too. It's like, I'm not, I'm not very versatile as far as like playing wise, you know, it's like, well, it's just like, I, I am personally, but it's like, I have to, you know, find my own path. It's like, you know, sticking me in with somebody else who's got, you know, like trying to fill Bill Hobson and Killdozer's shoes like I did on a tour yeah. was really oh. fucking hard for me because he's such a spastic guitar player. You know, it's fu- he's fucking great. But it's like, it's a, you know, it's so organic to only him what he's doing that trying to fucking fill his shoes is like, and I had that problem too with the human work. That the, you know, I was more, more a guitar player and they wanted a bass player and they, and they needed and wanted a heavy, you know, bass player a la Tracy Pugh style kind yeah. of action. 
which is like, you know, I wasn't born JJ Bernal. Yeah, just having having that just kind of like <laughs> really kind of rattling deep resonance that kind of you know shows shows you that like there's. It's business time, you know, like it's not like yeah. you're not fucking around. <laughs> and it's kind of like, you know, one of the anchors. I mean, it was kind of, kind of the same way with the cows where Kevin was like, you know, a massive anchor. Or like I said, Tracy Pugh. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. like the gold standard. Every, and, and so it was one of those things where it's like, I don't think it was a perfect fit by any stretch. Um, but I fucking, uh, you know, I played three shows with them. Opening for Big Black, opening for Scratch Acid and opening for the Butthole Surfers. I'm not complaining. Yeah, that's you know that's, that's just yours. like one of those things where you're just like, this is awesome. Yeah, and that's also yeah, and then they're and they're a band of their own. You men have their own identity and their own their own thing going on, and you know it's if the band that wants to get out and tour and someone can't tour, they're not gonna. That's not gonna fly, you know, flat out. Um, and it was a, it was a, it was their trip too. It's just one of those things where it's like as much as you love it, it's not my you know it's not my band. It's not what I want to do. Right, and that's when that, that, you know, when you think when you say it now, it sounds like such hubris. I mean, because they're such a fucking great band. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, sure, but but but, but you I, have your own ideas and what you're trying to get done, or what you want. You know what I mean? Should I want to tackle? Um, was definitely more more you know straight ahead rock and roll than them. Yeah, like like, like Halo Flies, character. for instance, where it was it was you know a lot of it was informed as much from like MC five or something as, uh, as anything else or, um, you know, its own way. What? Like the jam. I mean, who, <laughs> who, I never heard of either of these bands. What are you talking about? I had a Mac, I had a Mac at a conception, Mac at birth. I came out of a vacuum. I've never heard anything before. No, it's just, I always love that when bands do that. Like, yeah. you know, Ooh. what are your influences? Ooh. Ornette Coleman. Bitch, you like ACDC. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> You know, trying to put on airs, like, you know, yeah, yeah. like they came out of a vacuum or, or it's like, you know, oh, I've only been listening to like, you know, jazz improv my whole life, you know. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I'm really dude, you do three chord punk rock. Oh, are you? Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I sprung from the head of Zeus fully formed and, and playing this music, so. Yeah. That's one that's always been a, a, a sore spot, which I would, in my youth would call out immediately. Yeah. Especially the jazz one. That that one was always a pet peeve back in the day. That was like a lot of people would claim that one. And when I heard the song, I read an interview and they're like, it's all about the jazz. Pick up the phone. And they go, who is this? Like, Dude, I thought you were in this shit. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's almost like, oh, which influences can I claim that will make me look cool? Yes, yeah, very intellectual. It's like, dude, you play three chord shit. I love what you play. Shut the fuck up yeah, and yeah, play. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay to like rock music. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> well, I mean, basically, I pivot between Ornette Coleman and Bach. That's kind of a, you know, the exclusive yeah. realm I occupy right now. Stravinsky, maybe you know. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, Halo Flies was a rock band. It was like what, like eighty six and ninety one, somewhere in that neighborhood. I mean, there's a... I'm trying to think. I think we fired up in like 84 actually did the first recordings that never came out. And then I think we finally got the first record out in 85. Okay. This is the type of thing where I'm always like, I'm always wrong. Yeah. Well, memory is a, you know, you get the Rashomon effect. You know. Well, there's also that thing too, where I just don't care. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I did that. It doesn't not, come like, up unless you talk in, in a conversation like this ever. Right. Yeah. So that's how I always like the thing with like record collectors where they'll be like, you know, how many, how many yellow did you do on that? record it's like dude that was 1986 you know, it's like, right. you think this is how much time record? i gave that decision tom we've got the single coming do you want to do in color vinyl with it yeah sure what should we do um do red a like, couple hundred right. that was it that was the whole moment right there all seven seconds of it all seven seconds and it literally escaped <laughs> seven seconds after it was said yeah well so and the reason why I'm bringing up Halo Flies is because those early Halo Fly singles kind of led to Amphetamine Reptile and, and like you putting out other stuff and it becoming like the uh, the quote unquote trusted brand, if you will, of a of a certain type of like. We were just trying to be the Levi's of underground rock. That was our whole that was our whole mo- motivation. I like when I say something and there's just like silence. It's like, dude, I'm I'm being an asshole. <laughs> 
I was trying to think of something funny to say. I was like, nah, I'm just going to let that one sit. <laughs> Skinny jeans? <laughs> yeah, that, that would have been the comeback. Skinny that, jeans? That, yeah, that's good. I was going to say, there's a couple ways to go with that, but some, sometimes you just, sometimes you got to let the pitch sail past and uh, wait for the next one, you know? <clears throat> no, I mean, I definitely was conscientious of that just because it's like, the, the, I, I was just emulating the shit I love, which was like Gerard Cosloy's era of Homestead, I thought was fucking amazing. Yeah. Like, they went all over the place. He went all over the place, and, the, you know, I didn't realize it was really him until, you know, that it, I followed it as it was happening, but that, you know, it took me a while to connect the dots because I was out on the West Coast and it was pre internet where you couldn't find shit out. Yes. Uh, but, uh, which, which yeah, is a popular topic on this show about how things were just incredibly different. And no matter how much you bring it up, it's like it's hard to describe to people that haven't grown up with the internet. It's like it was so different. <laughs> so yeah. different. No, and that was part of it, but like, yeah, wanting to be, you know, like the, the stuff he did with Homestead at that era, I thought was fucking amazing. Touch and go of that time was a huge influence. Like I, you know, got into them at the hardcore point and then like followed them as they, you know, waltz right into doing super cool shit with a lot of other, you know, varied bands. Um, Discord, huge, you know, uh, just for, for Discord, the way the, the packaging and the, the even the fucking label logo was fucking cool. Yeah, there was like, like a, un- a unique aesthetic. You kind of like. It took me a long time to quit paying attention to them. Well, past. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Beef Eater where I was just like, "All right, I'm I'm out of here. You guys got your own thing going. That's good." <laughs> they've had a, they've had a couple good things since then. I not I, like I said, I'm not picking anyone. It's not no, my no, cup no. of tea. I, hey, hey, but it was like fine. so, you know. But I do remember the last thing that fucking told me just rocked my fucking socks off. Completely unprepared, like just picked up Rights of Spring. Yeah. What is man. this? Oh, it's Discord. I'm giving it a shot. Yeah. And fuck, did that live up to it? That, yeah, was, that like, was like from Pluto at the time, you know? <laughs> I thought it was fucking amazing. You know, I, I still listen to the shit out of that record. Fucking love it. You know, it's like. So, I mean, that, you know, at that level, they were definitely people I was trying to emulate, you know, labels. Um, there was other stuff too. I wasn't a huge fan of the product per se, but I loved the whole stiff records thing when I was a kid, the posters, the yeah. smart ass, you know, the sort of unified Fuck art, let's dance like yeah, t-shirts yeah, yeah, and yeah, just yeah. the, you know, the way they play, they play with covers and did stuff. I thought that was really cool. You know, their, their way of marketing was, uh, amazing to me. I loved it. Um, so yeah, it's like stuff like that. Um, Cause I mean, that was part of the pre, when we're talking about the internet, that was part of it is like you literally, you know, first off records were fucking expensive. I mean, they still are. Lord knows I make expensive records. But <laughs> yeah. You want to talk about making expensive records, buddy. <laughs> that's me. But so you had, the, but, but you know, you couldn't hear it. Like it was like, yeah. literally like, I've never heard of this band. Yeah. You know, what, what should I take my chances? And so you're looking for any clue, like you're flipping that cover over, like, well, what are the what are the graphics give off? Is there a band picture? What do they look like? But no, you know, so you're looking for every clue you can on the sleeve, you know, because I don't want to piss away that fucking ten bucks when I'm making four dollars an hour. Well, I and, mean, uh, I, I again, another subject I rattle on about all the time is how many records I personally picked up just because I was like, oh, that cover looks cool. This looks neat. What is? It? I wonder what this sounds like. Like that happened. Oh God, yeah, all the time. I mean, that's what you know, punk rock was for me. Was uh, my all my first. Uh, taste of that were visual you know pictures in cream magazine and yeah. weird fucking sleeves where you're like this is fucked up this looks cool well, so I mean, and it matched you know I, I, i'm hard pressed to think of his name but the guy that did all the buzzcock sleeves or oh, oh, the guy that did all the reed who did all the pistol stuff those guys yeah, yeah. were geniuses and it's just like yeah that pistol thing he fucking nailed it you know just like yeah i'm, I'm in yeah you're and like, then also you drop the needle and it's every bit is fucking great you know we were talking about Gang of Four earlier. That 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 entertainment album cover was also that was from Mars when I first saw it. Like, oh, totally, because it looks so mysterious and kind of like you're like, whoa, what is this going to even sound like? You know, those weird stilted thing, like he creeps the Indian. The Indian, yeah. you know, I don't remember the exact words, but it was like this weird stilted, you know, like like, like three panel fuck? story or something. And and you're just like, what is this about? Like, what, what, what's what's this band's deal? <laughs> yeah, and that was the. You know, so Kill, I, I, the one I always talk about too is like Killing Joke. I remember yeah. I, I just moved to uh, Minneapolis from Michigan as a kid, and uh, at a record store, and they did. You know, I was blown away. Like it, it's like a punk rock record store. I'm like, oh fuck! It's like you know, walking around with this huge fucking rock and roll bone. And then there's a single of this, you know, Fred Astaire dancing over this warscape of like fern trees and shit. <laughs> right. And the band is named Killing Joke. I'm like, what the. 
fuck is that? I gotta have it. It's yeah, gotta yeah. be good. Yeah. How can this be bad? And you then know it's probably not the music's suck. actually better than the fucking sleeve. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like this weird chunky post punk shit that you know completely once again like we were talking about before. I had no idea what you know. This is a left ball, left left curve. You know. Have you uh, have you? Uh, this is gonna be a wild digression, but have you checked out that Human Impact record at all that Chris did? No, I haven't. Heavy Killing Joke vibes. Uh, nice and weirdly, like in, in some parts, a little bit like the non lame part of King Crimson too. Like definitely doesn't sound a thing. Yeah, yeah. Same. You just, you just uh, I, my car just crashed. You just said King Crimson. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> no. car was spinning down the icy road and wrapped around a tree. <laughs> it's it's cool, man. It's it's it definitely it's it's heavy Killing Joke vibes, but it's it's not. It's been interesting seeing I think Crimson's like up there with Genesis, like one of those like Oh come on. I have a lot of friends who love that stuff and I'm like, maybe someday I'll get it. Maybe. There's... Maybe someday <laughs> I'll like it. I hope so. Look, don't force me in a position where I'm going to evangelize about King fucking Crimson because I'm not looking to do that. But they're, they're... you just want to cover. You just want to like go on a Genesis like spiel for like half an hour. I'm not a big Genesis fan. It's 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 it, it's, it doesn't bother me. But it's, I'm not going to look for it. It's I, I actually in prog in general is is kind of a rough genre for me. But there there is some King Crimson I like. Anyway, point of fact, Spencer's new band pretty cool. It doesn't sound a thing like Unsane. So I'm I'm curious to see. If the the sort of like dudes yelling noise rock fans that have like you know followed everything he's done, like this, what the level of bummer is for them, or if they're if they're going to be along for the ride? Because I think it's musically fascinating. It's like, oh wow, that's oh well, definitely. I mean, it sounds interesting as hell. I, I should you know that's where I'm I'm so errant. The older I get, the worse I get. Where it's just like, and especially now, there's no excuse. You like literally go search and click, yeah, click, click. Okay, I'm listening to it now. Yeah, I'm checking it out, and it's <laughs> like you can't. I mean, I definitely got, you know, there's like uh, 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 post-traumatic stress from doing demos for fucking decades. But it's, well, like, sure. it's actually, I, you literally go into work mode. Like, you know, you have to check this out. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's in the back of your brain, like, that's work. When, when it's not, it's, it's, it's just a ridiculous thing to say, even say that, but that, you know, you can't help it. You just get caught in that mindset sometimes. But yeah. no, I definitely want to, you know. Uh, 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 when you say it sounds nothing like Unsane, oh my fucking love, it's like I'm still interested. That makes it twice interesting. I know it's like there's what two members from Cop Shoot Cop with Yeah, them, yeah, exactly. I, I mean, it's, it's so it's, it's, you know, and no, you know, not to diss on like Cutthroat's Nine or any other stuff, but sort of like, oh yeah, that's sort of like I would expect, kind of expect that. Like it just kind of took me by surprise. Like I, I really dug it because it's like, yeah, the, it's, it probably has more in common with Cop Shoot Cop, frankly, than anything that uh, Chris has done in the past. But it's, it's interesting. It's it's cool, and I, I appreciate you know he's going for the big swing with it. And nice. I, I'm I'm always you know I always like to off my cap to someone that does a big swing like that, especially for someone that's got like a lot. You kind of you kind of have to to keep it you know change it up. Yeah. I mean, God, it's like uh, you know there's certain people I fucking love, but it's like, dude, thirty years, come on. <laughs> yeah, pulling fucking like their version on. of the Johnny Ramon thing. <laughs> yeah. I exactly. I love that story. That that you know that story, right? I'm sure where that he's just like he never practices guitar because he didn't want to change the sound. He's just like there you go. He nailed All it. All right. Well, I guess he built a career <laughs> on it. So like jokes on me. But hey, dude, check this out. Check this out. It's called a solo. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they have one in sedated. It's like one note solo. Nee, 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 nee. Who who is who is the guest person who played it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. They got, they got a sesh bro for that. <laughs> so talk to me about demos. Uh, because that's an interesting point and it's a weird thing to think about because now everything's like hey hey check us out on you know freaking frazzle you know, here we are like whatever but back in the day especially with the amrap you had this unified uh you know kind of art look this you you built up a rep as sort of being like a home for like kind of weirdos and uh cool outsider bands but there's demos and for every like one awesome thing, there's like 99 things that we'll charitably say. Are 99, not. man, where, where are you at? <laughs> Those are great odds. Now this is more like this is more like 999. Now there's a few that I remember. Like there was one time I got a tape, and they were mostly back then it was tapes uh, until like CD burners came into play by the you know, mid late 90s, whenever. But anyhow, I got a tape, and I've, I you know I just go, literally would rip a package open, not even look at nothing, just put the tape in, give it uh, you know three seconds to see if I needed to give it 10 and 10 to see if I was going to listen to the whole fucking thing. That was kind of the rule of thumb, you know, and, uh, fucking play it. This is really good. Play the whole fucking thing. I'm like, 
I'm work, kind of working while I'm doing it and letting this play. I'm like, this is fucking great. I go back and I'm like, that's it. I'm going to fucking, you know, write these guys or you know, see what the, what the trip is. Nothing in the fucking package. No note, no address, no fucking name on the cassette, no phone number, nothing. And I was just like, oh, fuck you. Like, really? Yeah. You, you, sent, you, you spent $3, which was an hour's wages back then, to send me this fucking thing. And you didn't, even, you know, you're too cool to write down your name on the goddamn cassette. Well, you just spared me probably a lot of misery because you're fucking retarded. You, know, <laughs> you have to be dealing with a fucking retard in a band. And Lord knows that's a pain in the balls. Well, do you remember? Did you ever find out what it was? Never found out what it was. <laughs> and that band was the Rolling Stones. <laughs> and that band was, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Now, the, another one, that I, the, one of the stories which I, I, I love was... Uh, had a rule in the office, which was uh, don't fucking march anybody into my office unless you ask me ahead of time or t- give me a heads up because I get fucking cranky as shit, especially if I'm like, you know, no. <laughs> elbows deep making an album cover or yeah, fucking you're doing working stuff. on some you're doing shit. Stuff. You're working. I'm working. And, I'm working uh, here. <laughs> Fra- Frankie Thorpe, Frankie Thorpe, who's in like hell, but at the time we, he was stock boy superhero, Frankie Thorpe at Amra. Just marches this band right into my office. Hey, Tom, these guys are here. They want to meet you. They're in this band. And I'm like, looking at him like, you fucking prick. Because now I'm on the, you know, now I'm on the spot. Now I got to be nice and I can't be a dick because, you know, they fucking came here to see the label and stuff. And so I would, you know, say, say my thing and try to usher them out so I could get back to work. It's like, hey, no, nice to meet you guys. And they gave me a CD. All right, I'll definitely check it out. And they, they walk out of the office, and I sit down, I put the CD in, and I'm like, holy fuck, this is really fucking good. And I wasn't a dick, so I say, you know, that was a saving grace right there. I'm like, this is fucking amazing. I'm like, Frank, yeah. Right after I berated him for marching him in, I'm like, are those guys still around? He's like, I think they're outside on the street. And we look out the window, and they're sitting in their van with the door open. All three of them are drawing. Mm-hmm. What are they doing? So we go out there and go, hey, I was checking out your demo. That's really fucking good. I look, they're hand drawing flyers for that night's show in St. Paul. They're, they're making the flyers in the van. They're Holy making shit. their flyers. <laughs> and they're playing in this fucking, this godforsaken metal club, which I've just heard their, 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 their CD. I'm like, dude, why, how the fuck did you get booked there? That's going to suck for you. Yeah. You know, it's like a metalhead club and a bad one at that. But it, it was like the Love 6-6 six, six, six guys. Oh, nice. And it was just like, I instantly like, oh, I want to put your stuff out. Like, it was just like literally spun the record one time. I was like, this is fucking amazing. And I'm still, to this day, waiting for the world to figure that the fuck out. <laughs> Do you find, I mean, obviously there's there's a lot of, there's a lot of bands that you put out. And, you know, some of them connected, found their audience. Some of them maybe, maybe less so. Do you feel like there's, like, what what are the best examples of ones that just, you know, the world didn't get it? Oh, I mean, one of the reasons I uh, initially, like in '98, I kind of just shut down the label. And yeah. one of the one of the biggest reasons for burnout for me, aside from the fact that I was spending most of my days doing business, right? Um, which you know, it's not what I signed up to do. I mean, I can do it. I can do it in my sleep, but that's not what I wanted to do. And when you're spending two thirds of your day dealing with the fucking water heater or that bill over there, <laughs> that kind of shit, yeah. and not music. It's like, yeah. why don't I, I just fax machine's plumbing. out of toner, you know? <laughs> go into plumbing, you'll make more money. But, uh, <laughs> but one of the reasons I, I fried out was because there were so many bands that I thought, this is it to me. I love these guys. This is a fucking game changer. I think these guys are going to fucking tear shit up and then to kind of, you know, watch it not uh, tear yeah. shit up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to varying degrees like some you know for varying reasons too like some people love shooting themselves in the foot and uh well love six six kind of did that i always say six six when i always forget the third six um the, you know we're, the, the third that six was, that was one of my time. favorite stories with them is like <laughs> we're like everyone in the office everyone in amber was really into that fucking record and just like this, this is you know it's kind of a it's a fucking new sound it's like taking a bunch of different elements and it's I'm fucking really cool i love this so we're all like you know, we're going to fucking put the, you know, we, we did this with all the bands too, but I just remember like, I'm not, you know, we're pulling all the chocks. We're going to, every time they're in the city, I'm calling everyone in that city and get them down to the show. And so I'm getting, you know, and, and I like, hit this report three or four times. And finally, like the fourth or fifth time I heard it was, it was calling Frank Kozakoy talked into going to the show. I'm like, Frank, what do you think? Dude, that was fucking horrible. I'm like, what? <laughs> he goes, 
those guys fucking suck, bro. Why the fuck did you talk me into whiskey? What? So then I call Kevin because they're on tour with the cows, and I call Kevin from the cows. Like, Dude, what's what's going on? Why the fuck am I hearing back from people that are hating on fucking Love Six Six because they were so great live and shit? He goes. Oh, dude, the second night of the tour, they decided they were just going to do noise sets. Ugh. So it was just like literal, like, <laughs> <laughs> and you're just like, oh, that's awesome. That is so great. You have just alienated every fucking writer, yeah, well know, done. every influential, like, tastemaker. That is well done. Well hey, done, guys. He's done a good job being a dick. Congratulations. And it wasn't, no, those guys, it wasn't, they were, it wasn't a malicious bone in their body. They weren't out trying to fuck with people. It was, they were literally, you know, rewriting the world in their heads. Yeah. You know, they believed it. It was like, you know, they, they, you know, that was, that was one band that actually did listen to the fucking noise jazz shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they weren't, they weren't fronting there. But it was the first time they stayed at the house. I was just like, uh, uh you ever heard of the Melvins? I'm like, no. This is like ninety six or something. Like really? Yeah, yeah, really. And remember, and they were all like intensive, like intensive musicians. Like you know, the, the shit they would talk about, you're just like, kind of freaked me out. Like really, you're you're doing a sub count of you know, and that's in three, four, and then you switch over to five. What? Really? You know, that's not what I'm hearing. But good for you. And I remember <laughs> dropping the Melvins, and they were just freaking out. Like, did you hear what he just did there? Like you know about yeah. Dale's drumming and shit. Yeah, yeah. Like they're like, holy fuck! There's other people in this universe weirder than us. Yeah, well, and they're not even coming at it from that like more super academic like Bill Laswell kind of place. Oh, the there. exact opposite, you know. It's like <laughs> I love Iron Maiden and Kiss, but this is how it comes out. Yeah, but it come, but, but also Captain Beefheart and Devo, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So you know, I can't I can't remember last time if you that and that's reminded me a little bit just of the bands doing weird stuff of. Uh, I can't remember if you said it on the show if you just said it in person, but the whole thing with choke bore, um, <laughs> can you, would you would you would you expound upon that? I mean, you put out like what three records from them? Um, yeah, they're a band that like they had their they had their audience that was maybe niche, but they pulled some kind of surprising moves, right? Um, are you talking about like just? Moving to Europe? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. No, I mean, it wasn't like they had a niche. They were actually like uh, the formula I had seen with bands that, you know, definitely went next level, uh, you know, from baby band to being able to like sustain themselves, like whether it was Helmet or Cows or, or even Melvin's, was you'd see this formula of like first time in Poughkeepsie, 20 people. Second time in Poughkeepsie, 100 people. Third time in Poughkeepsie, 400 people. Because they had that magic about them, and people would talk, and you know, you gotta come see these you fucking guys. See them, they're so good. Yeah, totally. And it's, I've seen it. You know, saw that with John Spencer. I mean, you can just go on the list. It's, it's, it was kind of formulaic. It was like this little thing, but if you paid attention, you could kind of tell who was going to fucking kind of you know rock it. Those guys were totally doing that every tour, like getting bigger, and it's like more and more attention. Toured with Nirvana, and then moved to Europe, and then never came back again. It was just like, God, really. Yeah, it was, kind of, it was kind of a bummer just because I, I think that their trajectory was uh, looking really good. You know, sales were the same way. It's like you know, if a band hits this thing on the next record and then does this one, they're going somewhere. You know, and then I just saw that trail off. I'm still a fucking. I still love Troy's. I don't know if you follow any of Troy's uh, solo stuff. I've heard a couple of them. Yeah, Vern's uh, Vern Rumsey from Unwound is a he's a big Chokeboard fan. He sent me some of the stuff over and i was i was like oh this is cool like it was sorry, he did the, yeah, sorry he did the last the last record yeah yeah which yeah. is a fucking great record um well i love the choke guys but it was just one of those things where it's like i can't i can't do this guys if you don't want to tour you know be in the states i just can't i can't help you there's nothing i can do but uh the, the solo troy stuff i i love that shit it's like and it's so it's so different it's such a different beast than choke too yeah, it hits way differently, and it's it's something where he's an interesting, interesting dude to figure out because I mean he does a lot of like um, like looping stuff too, and like yeah, when you watch the live thing, it's it's intense. Like you know, hit that foot, hit the notes over here, playing guitar. Yeah, it's definitely a a, a new take on the one man band, right. but it it works. You know, he he pulls it off. He doesn't have the symbols between his legs that he slams together. <laughs> Between the knees. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 yeah, 
Uh, Man, we could start a whole symbols between the knees band right there. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure it'd be as long as you included like a ukulele or something. I'm sure it'd be quite popular. Kazoo. <laughs> kazoo. <laughs> <laughs> Just kazoo's and cymbals only. <laughs> The two best instruments ever. I was going to say, incredibly versatile and not the least bit annoying in any way for either of those two. Good uh, job. Uh, talk about the Throne Ups, if you don't mind. Uh, I think I think that's a band that's almost kind of weirdly lost to history, except for the Uber record store. Which is weird because that shit owners. still sounds funny and great to me. Yeah. Now that was a. That was one of those moments where I remember me and Steve Turner were fucking bestest buddies. I would drive down to Seattle when I was in the service, and, and we'd been introduced by uh, John and the U-Men. And it was funny because the first time I met him was uh, the U-Men were playing up in Bellingham. And he's like, oh, I want you to meet these guys. They're like huge into Otto's Chemical Lounge, which was a band I was in before the service. And I'm like, Really? Someone's actually heard of that. <laughs> I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> and it was funny too because it was it was Steve and Mark, and they were totally being fanboys about it, which was weird. Because I'm like, dude, you two and probably four of the people give a fuck, you know. Right. But anyhow, we, we became really good friends, and I would like I would spend uh, weekends me and Steve just running to record stores and playing records and talking records, and you know, he turned me on to tons of fucking great shit, and hopefully, I did the same thing to him and. It was he was like one of my best friends at that point. But anyhow, he was going to college up in Bellingham, the other city. Yep. Between the two, and uh, so I'd go up to Bellingham because there was some amazing record stores up there. And mm -hmm. We you know hang out when he's in school, and uh, he's like, "I got this tape. I want you to hear it." Well, what is it? And uh, he's like, "Oh, it's me and Mark and this guy Ed." And this other guy, Layton, and we're just making shit up as we go. It's all improv. And I'm like, that's fucking horrible, dude. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. Just, I'm just going to tell you right <laughs> yeah, now. <I'm> no. <laughs> He's like, just play the fucking tape. You don't understand. I'm like, no, I understand improv. Yeah, no, no I get it. <laughs> I get it. And no, I mean, it's like not interested. So he gives me the tape and then I'm not, you know, get in the car. And I think I was driving back to the base. Fucking pop it in. I'm like, oh, this shit's fucking great. Once again, I was wrong. <laughs> well, and, and like it wasn't like it wasn't a uh, Mark on drums or something, if I remember. Right. Mark on drums. Yeah. I think Steve. I think was, no, Steve was playing guitar, but Layton was on bass, and Ed was just making up shit and the vocals on the spot. I got to sit in in a thrown up session with uh, Jack and Dino. Oh, really? I can't remember which single it was for, but I happened to be down in Seattle when they were recording, so I came on by and we're drinking beers while they're recording, and it was literally like, "And roll it." My cock is the going to that and the bank extension. <laughs> and it's like, it sounds rehearsed. Like, it literally sounds like ha falling apart, mind you. Like, early flipper falling apart. Yeah, I was going to say, very, very flipper vibes, for sure. Like, Northwest flipper is, like, what but, uh, I uh, thought, of, thought of. Completely, every song made up on the spot. That's They've never performed anything twice. Maybe lyrically, Ed might repeat himself, but they just, you know. And, but it's always, it always gelled. It always was cohesive enough to not sound like improv, and that's why I liked it, you know. Well, and there's but, elements uh, to stuff there too that Steve would like, kind of later, finely hone and, and use in Mud Honey in a much more, you know, kind of like not not the same sort of band, obviously, but uh, there, there were elements same, of that same, then. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, there was always right up there in his sense, you know, sense of, sense of humor and stuff. Uh, but yeah, I fucking and then add with the whole graphic thing because I mean that's. Later on, went on to like you know be, do illustrations for the New Yorker, which just fucking I, tickles me endlessly. Really? To know that, uh, yeah. If yeah, I like, knew that, I for forgot. years. Wow, that's wild. Okay. Um, you know, great artist. I mean, he's he's one of the guys that kind of I got into lino cutting because it's like his uh, from the lino cuts and wood cuts he did on some of the thrown up stuff. I fucking loved between him and Billy Childish. That was one of those things that like opened my eyes. Like I like this, you know. And that's why I pursued it, but. uh yeah, great, great artist, great guy too. Yeah, talk Ed Fotheringham, a fucked up accent though. I used to give him shit about that. What, what, what is, what, what was the Well, accent? he was, he was bounced. I don't know the exact history, but I know he went back and forth between parents between Australia and the states. Oh, okay. So he had, he had, so like he had a, this really half and half. <laughs> like it, it almost sounded like somebody doing a fake English accent who can't do it. <laughs> so it was an endless source of entertainment and me being a dick when we're drinking like dude what did you just say how did you say that 
Of course, I'm over here going, what'd you say there? Oh, geez, that sounds fucking goofy, huh? I can't believe you fucking said it that way, yeah? <laughs> so you, you brought up an important point with the land of cuts, and I, I realize we didn't talk about it this time, but I think it's it's fascinating that, like, you know, that's something where just as the world has sort of turned towards, uh, you know, a physical product being like an art piece, right? An, an art piece that comes with the music as well, and if it's for the people it is for, uh, it's not for everybody and literally there isn't enough for everybody but there's like you know human hands touch every piece of it you're carving these things and by lino cuts you mean linoleum right yes yeah like literally carving pieces of linoleum for these unique pieces of art that uh, that's what the jackets because are. I'm, I'm not a 19th century luddite i'm a 20th century luddite <laughs> Wood, oh how gauche! This is linoleum. <laughs> Join the future. Join 1910 when linoleum was invented. Was it 1910 really? Wow. I don't know. I just, I just know that that's like when it, it kind of made its its entry into the art world. Was that whole first? Uh, ah, I'm not going to go down that path. I, but yes, yeah, so yeah, I was going to say, don't worry. I'll get my finest fact checkers on that date, and that's all we need to know. It was the impressionists, so not the. Uh, oh yes, but yeah. Talk to me about the uh, like how how did you how did you come to have that be like the because that's sort of the the modern amrep. Well, aesthetic, I mean, first right? off, first off, yeah, it's it's all it's all I want to do, um, because first off, and I don't care what the fuck anyone says, you don't need to physically listen to music anymore. It's that's it's just a fact. And, you know, people, no, I only listen to vinyl. Oh, that's all you listen to in your car when you're at the gym and when you're in the fucking at work on like your computer. Fuck off. Yeah, it's like I love vinyl, but come on, let's be real. Um, it's it's a it's a you know object I've always fetishized my whole life. Like that to me was my entry point to lots of art, lots of physical you know reactions to visual things was through vinyl. And, scouring the racks and stuff um but then also part of it is what i talked about before my burnout the first you know amrep version one was i didn't want it to be a business and this is the best i can hone it to making records and moving on i get to do all the fun shit the creative part you know with like oh, fit the melvin thing like me and buzz bouncing ideas getting the shit done making it physically selling out and running on to the next thing. I mean, we get to do way more releases in a year because of the finite aspect of it. I don't have to worry about distribution, warehousing, you know, manufacturing, represses, all that shit that used Storage. to drive me fucking. That made it, <laughs> yeah, that's made it fucking horrible. That's what made it a job. Yeah. So I literally just ejected that. I don't send out fucking promos. You know, fuck you. Listen to it the way everyone else wants to, you know. Yeah, Look it up on YouTube. YouTube. It's all free. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> And that was one of the first ones, too, where it's like a, a smart acidly will say, it's like, why is this record so expensive? Because music is free. Yeah, because you don't have to get it. Like you can- There's no other way to make money off of it, dude. <laughs> You're in a band. You know that. You know what I mean? It's just like, a, uh, I th- my favorite story about that is early on, we were doing the uh, Melvin's John Spencer split single. And there was like some message board where people are talking and, and and stuff and like somebody's like why the fuck's that record so much oh this is the um the uh uh uh, black betty uh yes right yeah and and one guy complains like Uh, it's fucking 25 dollars for a fucking single that's ridiculous and the other guy's well yeah is it it even any good and the other guy goes well hold on a second and then he posts a youtube video of the song he just ripped during this conversation (laughs) and posted it on youtube and to give it to this guy i'm like and that's why it's twenty five bucks, motherfucker. You just answered your question. We're not going to make any more another money off this. <laughs> right. <laughs> we got one shot to make enough money to get something in the band's pocket, yeah, right. and to have a fucking budget to jump onto the next thing, you know. And that's 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 part of the the reason and you know the logic behind the way this is. It's like I don't want to, you know, the the old way of doing things, which as far as I'm concerned is fucking dead. But so many people haven't acknowledged that is you know you were tied up as a label you can only do so many releases a year if you were doing it quote unquote right which meant you had a distributor you had to wait 90 days for them to get it into their system you had to do all the proper promotion calling the right people and dropping it in the right laps and you know nudge nudge we listen to this and all that kind of shit so you could do effectively you know a handful of records a year if you're doing it right so to me it's just like like i said i just want to get off on doing the shit i like what I can't wrap my head around is how 
there's people who 10 years later are still upset by this. <laughs> as if someone is, is compulsory to buy these <laughs> it's, it's, it's the law it's bizarre to me like they're still like fucking you know it's, it's fucked up there's a rip off oh, okay then don't buy it Just, you know yeah, it's, it's like you got a pretty easy solution for you don't buy obviously it obviously it's not about the music that's why you're not you're not pissed off because you can't get the music that's not the fucking point yeah that one i did way back when we did the first amber at bash where it was like i made a bunch of records they're all literally, I think, 100, 200 at best. But it was for this one show. We're going to sell them all this one show. And we're done with it. And I'm looking at it going, well, these are expensive records. You know, fuck it. We'll put all the material on the CD. It's five bucks. Yeah. You can have you can people have go up like, how, how, much, how much is that 12 inch? That's $100. What? How much is this 7 inch? That's 30 bucks. What? That's fucking, no, that's outrageous. It's all the music's here on the CD for five bucks. You want that? No, give me the single in the ten inch. <laughs> yeah, well, and for whatever reason, the it, it's difficult for people, for a lot of people, to acknowledge the fact that the art can exist as an art piece as well as the music within it, and and they can the, both those ideas can be held in the mind at the same time. Yeah, it's not the only way this is going out there. You know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah, you're not you're not going to not be able to hear it. The YouTube thing is is exactly what I'm talking about. It's like if I reissue a cow's record and we only make 300 copies and it sells out. Well, first off, it's one of the only ways to get money into the hands of a band like the cows because if you do it the normal distribution route and regular release at regular prices, newsflash. No one's getting fucking paid. Yeah. yeah like, you'll, you'll break the even. The label ain't making something. shit. Yeah. The band ain't making <laughs> shit. Maybe a $200 check. That's fucking life. I mean, I'm not lying when I say that. Everyone knows that. Yeah. Um. So it's like this way. It's like, yeah, it's a, we're, we're charging $40 for the album. And the band gets, you know, half. No bullshit after cost. The other thing that people don't realize, too, is how expensive costs are. Yeah. You know, when we're making those records with the four or five color silk screens on the front and the back of the sleeve, yeah, you know, with the wacky doodle vinyl at, at a run of a hundred. Those doesn't those things are costing well over fifteen bucks a piece, strictly manufacturing. Yeah, just that's like, not including the band's recording time. <laughs> that's not including me getting compensated for doing art or anything like that. That's strictly raw cost, you know. Yeah, the the baseline like we have created a thing is that it it's 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 sitting about there. And and, and that's the cost of Literally the cost of doing business, but it's it's the cost of making something cool. That if it's going to be a unique item, like guess what, it's it is not cheap. Well, and here's the cheap. weird thing too: is like it, it, for most, of like you know, think about the gig poster, you know, poster gig world. Uh, uh, you know, think about a uh, Kozik in his prime, like doing prints, and the, some of the same people who are fucking screaming and pissing and moaning and bitching wouldn't hesitate to buy a fifty dollar print. Yeah, well, just... that's a poster. <laughs> you know, it's a poster with five colors. Here's a fucking print on both sides of this and vinyl, and I'm going to charge the same as that artist charges for a print, which I'm not belittling the arts. I think they should, you know, you should get whatever you can fucking get, you know. But it's that weird punk rock thing that's existed forever, which is, God forbid, people I like actually make anything. Yeah, and and you know, I've I've taken a comment at the uh, punk rock, and I we're talking about at this point too. We're talking about fifty-five-year-old guys. We're not talking about about eighteen-year-old kids who can live on ramen and farts for fucking two years. <laughs> you know, yeah, and, it's and, like my time is worth something to me now, and it's the same with the you know the people that I work with. It's like I'm gonna get paid. That's why this isn't you know we're not live like I said you know in the basement of this fucking squat. You know, in the Lower East Side in 1989. No, that's not what this is. You know. Well, and it's also something that you know. I, I certainly, for whatever reason, had to be deprogrammed myself, even thinking that way of just like this. The idea of even not only charging something like what it's worth, but like not having like the uh, attendant guilt of charging what it's worth, uh, and just being like, you know what, like good vibes and like you know. Like dirt cheap prices, don't put gas in the gas tank. That doesn't that doesn't help like propel thing along. And and, and no, and like I said, we we all did it when we were nineteen. We could do it when we were nineteen, you know. Yeah, but I mean, part of it too is is like you know people bitching like, on the price front. It's like if it was overpriced, it wouldn't sell out in thirty seconds. Yeah, it's well. I mean, I'm not I'm not claiming I'm fucking Tito Hannon. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like. A 30 second sellout, maybe we could charge, you know, five times that and probably still sell out in four minutes. 
you know, there's a demand and it's like part, part of it also too is the physicality of like, we can only make and ship X amount of copies and then move on to the next thing. Well, because I mean, it's yes, for by, the people. By that all work. rights, right? Exactly. By all, by all, by all rights, we could, you know, keep upping the pressing side and try to get up more and more to meet to figure out where that line is. I'm not doing that again. I don't. I don't fucking care. You know, uh, it's it's like I want to make what we make and we move on. Totally, and I, you know, that aesthetic also holds true with you keeping the dope guns and fucking in the streets stuff going. Uh, you know that, like that last one that you know you had a. Uh, you know, Horries and Novacron, Lydia Lunch, you had Reptoid on it, which is great. And I, I, I was like, that's a rock solid ethos. That thing played really fucking good. That, yeah, that, it came that, out that awesome. Percentage. It was just like, and that I always lucked out. I think also, too, just the, the reputation of the series. I've never had anyone just hand me a turd. Like, you know what I mean? Just like, <laughs> right. uh, we're, we're the fuck nuts, and Hayes asked us to do this. Is there anything laying around? Yeah. Oh, that one reject from that album? Yeah, give him that. Yeah, I mean, like, I've, you know, the horror part, song rips, and it's like, you know, one of the only non-album tracks of that. I mean, there, it's all through it. Like, some there every once in a while, like, Christ, I was listening to something the other day, and I was like, wait, what is this? I don't think I have this record. And I was like, oh, it's off one of the comps. That's awesome. And, like, I just, I don't even remember what it was, so sorry, but this is actually a terrible story. Yeah. <laughs> but Your stories are terrible. I'm not talking to you anymore. Story sucks. <laughs> but it, the fact, you know, you got 14 freaking volumes of this thing that, like, and again, it's hard for people to contextualize that have this, you know, reverence for the, th- those that came before and looking at things with an eye towards how things are now versus how it was at the time. But, you know, a lot of the bands that were on the Dope Guns and fucking in the streets, they weren't, you know, big famous household names, even amongst the un- underground. They, they were like that. In some cases, it was like first release or just kind of like, you know, early release. No, that was, that was part of the formula. What I wanted to do with it, too, was to... Uh... You have a baby band like Love Six Six Six. Speaking of them, you know it's just like, well, you know, if we can saddle them up with a bigger name, so that the, you know Jesus Lizard will carry these guys because everyone right. loves them and knows, but they don't know these two bands. So that was always kind of the formula. It was like you know as big a band as we could get for the genre or that hadn't done it that I loved, you know, with a mid tier and then usually two unknowns, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and, but and quality, and and you get to like sneak in like you know a king snake roost or, <laughs> or something that for people that otherwise would be like oh huh this is cool and then you also get to sort of celebrate like having you know like your shield pull bathtubs or like brainiacs or whatever along, along those lines also and it's kind of like again just like you know building the building the house that you know that like, okay, what's going to come out of here. You don't necessarily know what's going to come out of here, but it's going to be something worth your time and your attention. Hopefully. I think no, it's, I mean, it's a- successful. I mean, again, coming out from the perspective of, of a fan and like, you know, like it's, it definitely was like, Oh wow, I'll check this out. And you know, did I mean, I like part, part of that, no. part of that sunk in when we did the, the recent reissue where I did dip my toe into like, all right, let's try to do reissues the standard industry standards way. Yeah. And there was a handful of stuff where you read it and, you know, didn't make fuck all, nothing couldn't give the band you know what i mean it was just sucked but the, the actual product similar cool they're doing the three lp monster you know dope guns with oh, vinyl the, the whole big, yeah, 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 yeah. and it being a three trifold you know just got to go crazy with the packaging which is probably why there was no money made. <laughs> yeah, well, it turns out it cost a lot of money <laughs> as the cost it turns out doing a trifold three lp set at a reasonable price no one's making a goddamn money yeah no one's gonna make um, a cent on that but it looks cool <laughs> but it looks fucking great yeah, exactly. i was really it stoked yeah <laughs> um yeah, so I mean that that on that level, it, but it, but when I was putting that together, it was like this is actually fucking cool. Like it, can, I'm not a very rem, you know, I'm not very nostalgic, and I don't really sit and think about the old times and the good days. Or, you know, it's not me. It's like I always want to. What's what's happening tomorrow? You know, what can yeah. I do now? Um, but that was one of those few moments where you're just like, oh, this this fuck, this is a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's okay. <laughs> did did all right. It was like that. I, I actually used that voice too. Yeah, it was yeah, pretty good. Good right. moment. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. You did okay with this one, boss. So, cool. when you, when you think about stuff that you that you're excited about doing now, and and you know a lot of it's like you know Melvin stuff, things along those lines, but there's still there's still stuff that you know, we'll catch your ear that you'll put out now and again. Is it just like, it, it, it almost seems like it's 
like on an adventure basis like what would be cool to do like that lydia lunch thing was awesome because i mean she played um retro virus played the uh the bash which is fucking awesome it was great weasel walter brought the damage it was yes super good that was awesome i was excited to uh i was excited to finally you know see some of those songs play live because you know i have like you know all those old records like i, I had a eight-eyed spy tape Tape. Oh, I fucking loved it. It's fun. <laughs> They're actually I got out. to see them at a fucking art museum in nice. 1980. It was fucking amazing. Nice, nice. And and, and I, I think that it's sort of interesting to that there's like a balance between, again, not exactly backwards looking stuff like nostalgia, but stuff that had been in the past, but stuff that's very much of the now also. And well, I mean, part and part like doing doing a lot of the reissues. Um, is about the only way I could get excited about doing it because I'm not very nostalgia orientated. Right. So it's like, despite the fact that, you know, uh, uh, Sexy P Story is a fucking, you know, phenomenal album and should see the light of day, uh, it's just like, I can't, you know, it's like, to de- you know, like we're talking about dedicating your life to getting into the way it sh- should be done through distribution, making as many copies as possible, trying to sell, sell, sell. Yeah. It's just not, I don't want to do it. So it's like, this is a way for me to, you know, be able to do that. It's also feeds me, uh, I shit to work with, to do this. It's like, if you, you know, if I, I had to sit down and write a thesis on like, well, I spent a long time doing art records as part of my whole genre author of, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> it, it's, but it motivates me. It's like, that's right. I fucking love this record and I want to do something you know, different and try to, you know, regurgitate it without you know trying to hone into some some ties to the to what happened before but not trying to relive the past well some of it's like entirely. they're almost homages to themselves right like you have like the, the that cherub's record where it's sort of like oh you know if you know the original album cover then it's like oh yeah that's like it's like referencing the original album cover but it's sort of like a stylized like new artistic version of that god i love that record yeah which is awesome that's like that's like Fucking great record too, uh, but I think it's 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 interesting that it manages to be both things, which can tap into that nostalgia vibe, but also live on its own as its own. And and part of it too is it's like I'm I'm too old to fucking you know like I'm gonna roll up my sleeves and get together with a bunch of twenty year olds and we're gonna do something new and different. I am what I am, you know what I mean? It's like my history is tied to my ankle. I'm not trying to escape it, but at the same time, I'm also not like you know reveling in it like remember that time i did that one record yeah <laughs> hey remember that one time i did this one you know I'm, yeah yeah oh I, I hope it doesn't come across that way because that's not my intent but no no not at all and i think that that's and, and i got i gotta be careful about not getting my soapbox about things but i think there's a culture of like nostalgia and, and backwards looking now that is I, I find find somewhat alarming uh, so I think it's interesting. Oh, I, yeah, definitely. It's definitely that's a nice way um, to put it. It's, it's, <laughs> it, it creates it creates a level of stagnation, and I'm certainly guilty of it on doing stuff where it's like you know, only doing the reissues. The reason I you know there's I, there's like lots of bands I fucking really dig that are new, and it's like it's I'm just I don't have the energy to try to fucking kick against the pricks for on behalf of a new band like I did for you know 20 years. Yeah. It's, I just uh, don't, you know, I mean, like once in a while I'll still break down. Like we did, a, 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 I did a CD with these, the, the Mr. Uh, Flies out of Cincinnati. Who Cincinnati. I fucking yeah, yeah. love. Yeah. Um, I think they're fucking amazing. It was one of those things where I was, you know, stumbling around the internet. I can't remember if they sent me a link or I just stumbled on it through Facebook, whatever it was, you know, these, these two kids out of Cincinnati. And it's like, I fucking, this is amazing. So it's like, I'll still break down and like, try, like, I'm going to do the CD and we're going to, let's do, you know, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of weird, too, because it's like the whole 40 and over crowd, in general, does not want to hear anything new. Right. <laughs> and I don't <laughs> care how yeah. outside the box they think they are or how, how free will, you know what I mean? Like, I'm a creative. I'm different. It's like, bitch, you still listen to the same albums you fucking liked when you were third, you know, 25 still yeah. to this day. It, the the, the oh. story that they've told themselves is that they're still very open minded and listen to new stuff all the time. Well, in fact, they don't. Yeah, and I, I know that just from social media where it's like, you know, I can post a, a fucking just screaming track from an unknown band and get 20 likes, and then if I repost a fucking Cow's Classic or something, it's like, you know, 300 people love. Yeah. Oh, man, I remember that time I saw them in 93. 
Yeah, and you're like, it's a, that's fine. I mean, it's, it's great on one hand, but it's like, dude, this other band's fucking amazing, yeah. you know? The world didn't stop because you stopped paying attention. And- exactly. But I just, I, part of me is just like, I, I still get the urge to want to take that on. And it's like, the old wizened man in me says, don't do it. Stop. It's think. it's not gotten any easier. I'll say that much. I mean, it's it's. Oh easy. God! It's, I mean, I can't even imagine being a new band now. It's just like a, on, on certain levels, it's like oh Jesus. Yeah, I mean, if I, per, I mean, speaking personally, if I didn't didn't even have if I didn't have a <laughs> certain <laughs> advantages, I severely doubt that I would be a, that I'd be doing it myself even at this point. As much as I love music, it's just it's it's just a nightmare without a dream. And and the rules change every couple months, and like nothing. It's, you know, it, it's fine because it, it, for for me, it's just sort of like the adventure of it is, do, is the doing of it. And I think that that's. Yeah, the, the, the thing we were at together down in Texas, like that, that was fun. Yeah, that, that was, was great. Cool. That, that was, was like awesome. total hole in the wall. There's like 75 of us there having a good fucking time. And like that, that shit, it's like. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, that doing that shit is not, you know, I can't imagine there's a new band where you, you know, get 50 bucks in a 12 pack. And a fucking 600 mile drive after. Yeah, it's a lot easier when you're in your 20s. That's for goddamn like, sure. <laughs> but so <laughs> that's enough said on that. So uh, talk to me real quick about the bash. Uh, is there going to be any more of them? I mean, obviously you don't have the downtown location anymore. Uh, is, is that like a done deal? Is that a, is that a thing in the past? No, it's I I, I uh, we've revamped some stuff at Northeast where that's a possibility, and we were actually I was toying with uh digging in or possibly like seeing what to what was shaking but then you know this whole fucking yeah ebola aids thing kicked in jesus christ i mean yeah like we i get it because it's like catterwall was like okay i guess we'll maybe postpone it to the fall well you got you got like fucking muckety mucks saying we aren't doing you can't have any events for 22 years like jesus really dude yeah I mean, nobody knows anything, and that's the one unifying thing. Is that even people that say they know, oh, well, it's going to be this. I'm like, how do you know? You're just talking out your ass. Well, then here's the here's the kicker: now it's politics is involved. Yeah. Now it's all politics, and you've got this side on that side, and this side on that, and so it's like guaranteed that nothing will get done. Chosen facts. You'll slog out, and there'll be a punching match over all. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. If you listen to this network, you have one set of facts. If you listen to this network, you've got another. <laughs> yep. And then, you know, and so now there are politics involved. So you got, you know, Republicans playing this game and Democrats playing that game. And it's like, we're going to hunker down and never open the doors. And we want to open the doors right now. And it's yeah. still help bullshit. But it doesn't help anything. It's not like anyone's being reasonable. Yeah, it's 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 not going to get us any. I mean, we're just. And so the nice. So the one cool thing about doing like a bunch of these shows like this and just freaking talking to everyone is that everyone all across the spectrum, any type of band, any type of person. Everyone's in the same position. Everyone's in the same boat. Nobody knows what the fuck's yeah. going on. And that's actually been really cool because I feel like there just aren't those sort of unifying events anymore. It fucking sucks that it's a pandemic. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it, it sucks how we got here, but, like, it is interesting that this moment in time, like, for better or for worse, and manifest differently, like, everyone's sort of in the same boat. And that's that's been... Really yeah, but the thing is, like, I, I'm hoping this is make, make, make stuff for it to break because it's, like... You know, if you're under 30, it's a whole different scenario than if you're 87. Yeah, no, for sure. So it's like I, I, they drag the shit out. I mean, the, the illegal fucking basement shows and shit are probably going to be a big wave of the future. I mean, I think it's I think it's just a nat- matter of time, really. I mean, that, that you can only, you know, n- n- with, you can sit there and like, you know, wave your finger and be like, well, that's not safe. That's not people going to fucking do it anyway. Are you kidding me? That's like, <laughs> well, I mean, Jesus Christ, I, I've watched people doing that online and it's like, you're the same guy who banged junk for two years. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> and you, I know how fucking promiscuous you were in really hideous situations. Shut the fuck up. Yeah, you discovered you condoms I mean? in like, 95. Also, like, <laughs> how, how many punk rockers I know are clutching their pearls and being the church lady. You're like, really? Really? Just shut the fuck up, dude. Just seriously sit down and shit. Are you kidding me? And, and then it's the, like, I can't. Oh. And then there's the other side of it where people are just like, you know, so loose about it, like, whatever, it's not even really happening. It's like, okay, dude. It's a hoax, dude. It's all a hoax. I don't care how much QAnon you watch. This is actually happening. You're being a freaking asshole right now. Yeah. So having literally nothing to do with any of that, uh, real quick, so I want to try to uh, wrap things up here. Tell, tell me about Oxop. Uh, there's there's an Oxop site uh, that's kind of like the clearinghouse for like all the like the new 
art stuff, all the new uh, uh, seven Oh, that's inches kind of like a remnant from the gallery of uh, 10 years ago. Right. Um, but uh, it's actually kind of being kicked around. Well, not kicked around. It's actually moving forward, which is a, a physical location. revival of the right. Oxop Gallery that was behind the, the downtown Minneapolis Grumpy's Bar for years. And uh, the developers who bought the bar and were putting up a condo or apartment um, at, at one point after the deal was done, I asked, like, hey, can we use this name Oxop? And I was like, knock yourselves out. Go for it. To slap on the building. I thought it was kind of kind of funny uh, um, from my side, which is like, you know, leaving your mark. Right. <laughs> totally. Uh, on, on, you know what I mean? Like the city, certain people, elements of the city can drive by and see that and remember what used to be there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, but the guys were fucked up. The developers were fucking amazing because they, they said, you know, you want, we want you to do a gallery in this, this new space. And I said, well, you know, the rent's got to be right to do a gallery. And they yeah. said, what's that? And I said, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> because let's not beat her on the bush, man. Right. You're not, you're not looking necessarily to take something on and have it be another money hole. Like it. <laughs> Not, yeah, and galleries, it's a, they're not, you know, they're not profit centers. Yeah. You, know. you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't exactly term them profit centers. Exactly. Um, and then that, that frees you up to be able to do the, we got, we did really cool shit because it was affiliated with the bar and we were paying nothing. You know what I mean? It was an old garage that we fixed in it yeah. to be the gallery, an old, you know, literal industrial garage space. Um, cause the building that the bar was in was, at one point was a scaffolding company, you know, so it's an industrial building. We, we fixed it up, but there was no rent, you know, we just were tagged onto as part of the bar and we did shows. We got to do crazy shit that you just couldn't do if you were paying, especially these days, you know, downtown rent. Yeah. So we're working on, you know, pull, pulling together and I'm trying to pull some people together to, you know, to, to fire it up. Um, the recent events definitely making that dicey <laughs> you know what i mean just like yeah you know gatherings and people coming out and art and just the whole works i mean yeah it's gonna be rough a rough road regardless of when we're talking about the politics of the shit before it's like you know, one of the things i think is being ignored by all sides is the fucking wreckage everyone's creating for after this yeah it, it's it's gonna be i mean certain things you're you're not like even if you pick up the pieces you're never gonna be able to put it back together again or it's at least gonna no i mean it's it's a, you know the best thing to do is like you know it's like you know uh, that thing in mind like you mentioned the economy you're a heartless bastard well economies are kind of like environments you know they're they're a fragile fucking thing you don't believe me go to fucking rwanda yeah and you it's know, <laughs> I just saw, I just read an article in Reuters that, you know, the UN report saying, if this is as bad a depression as we think it's going to be, we're probably going to be like 300,000 kids dead, you know, worldwide. And you're like, yeah, that's fucking hideous. Well, and it's, it's maddening enough to not be able to get a sense of scope and scale of things or really have it, you know, the average human beings not going to be able to affect this in any way, shape or form. And I think that that lack of control as well as, you know, Christ, you turn on the news like any, any which one you went over. It's just like, hey, here's the litany of terrible things, and here's how bad everything is all the time, and even more so than normal. And uh, yeah, it's I, I just the mental state of whoever's left. You know what I mean? Like, I, Christ, one of the reasons I keep you know cranking these episodes out the way I'm doing is it's like it keeps me sane. You know, I'm just tearing yeah. through them, and, and it's like I I've been very upfront about it. Like, you know, oh, why are you doing so many of these? I'm like, well, what the fuck else am I gonna, do I have to do? I can't do work. I can't make records. Got laid off from a day job, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, yeah. I can do this. And, like, this is, like, a small bit of community in the wilderness that people can, like, latch on to and, like, find something with. And if I can help in some slight, small way having these conversations, I'm going to do it. Because I sure fuck can't do anything else. Yeah. Well, I've noticed, too, like, uh, on social media, the conversation is... You know, from from my perspective, closed. Like I said, once it goes political and everyone's figured out and they've locked down their jackboots to whatever ideology they are fucking associated with, the, you know, what's the point of talking anymore? We all know that. Yeah, it doesn't stop people from getting out there on their you know whatever left wing or right wing high horse and telling you how it's supposed to be. But the truth of it is, it's fucking pointless. <laughs> Those conversations, as we all know, are pointless. Yeah, I, and I, unfortunately, I, this this conversation has hit that turf where it's just like. You know, literally ran into a thing where I made the mistake. I can kind of get, you know, 
it takes a little bit to click in with you and you go, okay, this is, we're at that point. You should just shut up now. Don't, don't fucking broach it. Made a mistake pointing out this is kind of, you know, there's a middle ground. You know, it's not a hoax. It's yeah. not Ebola. <laughs> Let's look at the middle ground before we did, you know, and literally gets it instantly got pilloried as a fucking heartless person who wants to kill grandma. You're just like, that's not what I said. Well, because also <laughs> like the idea of critical thinking itself is like an outmoded concept practically, but you, you, uh, you actually hit on something that I think is a funny, a, a, a friend of mine, Mark Schaefer, he had this term called the coconut. And he termed it as like in band practice, you you have the like, you know, you the, you're playing with your band, you you play your songs, like where you jam out a little bit. And then like at the end of like the jam out, there's just the, the point where, you know, the drummer starts going for the bell of the ride. There starts being some like jokey slapping and popping. Like it just goes off the rails and it needs to stop immediately. And he's, he's always called that the coconut. And I think we reached the, the coconut, coconut of conversation about the quarantine and COVID-19 because it's like, you're, you're just, y'all are base slapping and hitting the bell of the rider right now. I mean, this is, this is not getting you anywhere that is going to be important. <laughs> exactly. And I don't, I mean, don't get me wrong. I take, I take this very seriously, but it's, it's like, what am I going to do? Go get in arguments with strangers about things and like, not like convince them in any way, shape or form. Because it's like, I, I feel like also there's this purposeful point of just point, putting everybody in a radicalized camps. So, oh, you have to be this type of radical or this type of, it's like, no, I'm, I, there's more to it than that. I'm, you know, I'm, it's like the prisoner. Yes. Well, that, <laughs> I'm well, not that's, a number. that's the big picture of, of the last 10 years is like, we've become this ultimate binary society in which there's only two solutions for every problem. Yeah. There's only two. And you're just like, really? Cause my life experience tells me there's literally a fucking million paths you can take on any given moment around any situation. Some right, some wrong, some all over the fucking place, but really two, that's all we get Two. Yeah. And it's, <sighs> Yeah, that's that's actually just as depressing as the quarantine, frankly. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, good at that. Uh, yeah, on a, on a different note, uh, hey, I wanted to say thanks for coming on the show again. It's always great talking to you, Tom. Uh, I don't remember. Well, thanks for having me. I don't remember if I asked you this last time, and if I did, I'm sure the answer no. is different anyway. But uh, no, the answer is no. <laughs> I developed this can a question because it's like hearing how people respond to it, and it's it's I usually end the, the shows with it these days. And the, the question is, uh, why do you do what you do? Fuck, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you jerk off? Because <laughs> it feels good. I don't fucking know. I don't think about this shit. I just do it. Fair enough, man. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I've never been accused of uh, deeply pondering any given situation. <laughs> uh, it, it's always a pleasure talking to you, man. Thanks for spending some time on the show. All right, mister. Thank you for calling. All right, brother. Take care. Having me. Stay safe. All right, later. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Oh, there he goes. The Haze. Hazelmeyer. I'm sorry I called him the Haze just now. That's terrible. I should not. <laughs> it sounds like Purple Haze Kush. Where am I going with this? I don't know. Uh, hey, so that's Tom Hazelmeyer. And you can go to uh, all things Hazelmeyer at... Um, this thing on box up uh amrep.com there, there's like it's on facebook he's 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 all over the place on the internet instagram twitter he's can you hear me? probably facebook's the best frankly but you can find out uh, whatever he's up to there was some alive at the fucker club special reissues uh with melvin's i think i think that's the latest thing. i don't know just fucking look on the internet man what am, what am, what am i the answer man i might be annoyed now <laughs> Oh, there he goes. Indeed. Thank you, Brandon Musikoff. Live listeners, uh, it's a karate episode. Music on, music off. Uh, Gf Farina. Well, not karate specifically. Gf. No, no, no. This show is called Protonic Reversal. It airs on Radio Nope. Thursdays. As we come to the close. 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 Central, 6 Mountain, 5 Pacific, and many other times as well these days. RadioNeutron.com for the archives. Uh, Patreon.com slash Protonic Reversal. Mr. and Mrs. America, 
All ships at sea. Get episodes sooner that way. One dollar a month gets you there. Anyone within the sound of my voice. No sponsors, no ads, no problem. No kidding. I've got double header. Fifty thousand watts of power. It's like running a marathon. I'm like, yeah, let me do two more. <laughs> Uh, thanks for all the support you've been giving the show, everybody. Appreciate it. Sharing the episodes around, all that nonsense. Helps grow what this is. Uh, thanks for people this reaching out that have enjoyed the episodes. Turns sound into electricity. Stay safe out there. Can you hear me now? Take it easy. Out on Route 128, the dark and lonely. I got my radio on. Can you hear me now? to my top 10. I'd like to thank our sponsor. But we haven't got a sponsor. Not if you were the last man on earth. She was prepared to prove it. This one goes out to a special girl. There is no special girl! It's the... It's the end of radio! The last announcer plays the last record! The last what? Leaves the transmitter! Circles the globe in search of a listener. Can you hear me now? broadcasting if there's no one there to receive it's the end of radio as we come to the close of our broadcast day
Radio. Can you hear? 